This is Cowboy Whispering My Name. Coming Home to North Dakota, Western Sweet Romance, Book 11. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by Jay Dice. Chapter 1 Putting God first in our lives helps us to have the attributes of God. God is love, and He loves unconditionally. A marriage will last when both puts the other above his or her self. Sherry Phillips, Georgia Katie fingered the brown leaves of the houseplant she'd been given last fall. Her good friend, Daphne, knew of her affinity for houseplants and had given it to her after Katie had found out her husband had been cheating. At the time, it had been green, vibrant, full of life, and beautiful. Today, the last green leaf had finally turned brown, and as her fingers gently touched it, it fell off in her hand. The plant was officially dead. So much about that seemed to represent her own life. Downstairs, on her kitchen table, a brown manila envelope held papers that would, at least in the eyes of the state, declare her 13-year marriage over. She'd spent her 20s with a man with whom she'd expected to spend the rest of her life. Now, she was looking at her 30s, spending them alone, a single mom a struggling single mom. Beside that manila envelope lay a notice from her bank. Her mortgage was six months late. She believed in positive thinking, in focusing on the good things rather than the bad, that what a person thought about became bigger in their mind. She believed all of that, and yet, what did a person do when it seemed like there was nothing positive to focus on? Debbie, her oldest child at ten, who had always been a straight-A student and a well-behaved kid, was acting out in school. Debbie's teacher had sent several notes home saying that her academic performance had basically fallen off a cliff. And sweet little nine-year-old Gwen, who just wanted to please her parents, found herself struggling between two factions. Not because Katie wanted her to, but because her ex, Russell, always blamed Katie when anything didn't work out, even if it was obviously not Katie's fault. He took advantage of the fact that children didn't always respond to logic, but were more ruled by their emotions. And even though Katie could easily see the gaps in his logic, the kids still blamed her. For everything. Just this morning at the breakfast table, Raymond, her youngest at seven, had melted down, screaming that if she had been nicer to Daddy, Daddy would have stayed. After she'd gotten him settled, she figured out from talking to the girls that was something that Russell had told them over the weekend when they'd stayed at his house. Apparently, the kids had been giving him a hard time because he wasn't at home with Mommy, and he had told them that Mommy hadn't been nice to him, which was why he had to go to Robin, so he could be with someone who wasn't mean all the time. It had made her so angry she had been shaking, and still was even after she'd gotten the kids on the bus. That was far from the first lie he'd told them. But short of telling her kids their father was a liar and they shouldn't believe anything he said, she wasn't sure what to do. What Russell was doing made no sense to her, since he didn't want custody and often didn't show up to take the kids for his scheduled visitations. If he didn't want them and didn't want to make time for them, why was he so intent on making them hate her and prefer to spend time with him? She dropped the dead leaf onto the soil in the pot and turned from the plant to the window beside her. Her house had been on the market for two months, and no one had shown any interest in it. She couldn't lower the price any more than she already had because she couldn't sell it for any less than what she owed on it. 
the child support Russell had been ordered to pay hadn't been nearly enough. He'd wanted things shared equally, and had made a great show to the judge about how he wanted the children. And even though Katie had seen right through that, she couldn't keep from fighting for custody for herself. Because Russell had wanted them and she'd ended up with custody, the judge had lowered his child support. Her phone buzzed in her pocket, surprising her, since she hadn't paid the bill and couldn't. Everything she had saved was going toward the mortgage payment. She had expected her phone to be turned off. She didn't feel like talking to anyone, though, so she just let it go, continuing to stare out the window at the flat North Dakota landscape. The promise of spring was in the air, new life, shoots of green, blue skies, puffy clouds, and that scent, deep and rich and exciting, that the earth had when it was waking up from a long, cold, hard winter. She loved that scent. It smelled like spring and promise and anticipation. Warm days, cool nights, laughter in the backyard, bonfires and swimming, lightning bugs and lazy afternoons. Not anymore. God, what am I supposed to do? How do I fix this? I didn't break it, and I resent the fact that I'm here. Resent that because of Russell's broken promises, my life is shattered. She hated the fact that there was still a part of her that wished Russell would come back. Wished he would realize she was the one he really wanted. That Robin wasn't the perfect woman he thought she was. And he regretted leaving Katie. As the months had gone by, she tried to recognize that for the fanciful thinking it was. After all, Robin didn't have nearly the stress that Katie had. Plus, she was ten years younger. Russell wasn't going to magically see that he had thrown away something that had been beautiful for fool's gold. Some people seemed to be incapable of ever admitting that they made a mistake. Russell had always been one of those. The only mistake she'd ever heard him admit to was marrying her. Tears pricked her eyes, but she blinked them back. She would be happier, better off, if she stopped chasing the things she wanted and started reaching for and appreciating the things God wanted her to have. After all, God had allowed this into her life. He must have had a reason, even though she couldn't see it now. The thing that concerned her now was that if God allowed all that bad stuff into her life, maybe he was going to allow more. Maybe the house would be foreclosed on, and she and the kids would be out. Maybe she'd lose the kids completely if she didn't have a place to stay. Her phone buzzed again, and while she still wasn't feeling like she was fit for human company, it could be the school calling. So far, Debbie's outbursts hadn't been so terrible that the school felt like they needed to call her. But far from thinking positively, she kept bracing herself, thinking that today could be the day everything got worse, and things she thought could never happen to her would. After all, she had a lot more days like that in the last year than she ever thought she would have. It wasn't the school and she didn't recognize the number, although it was a local exchange, so she swiped and put it to her ear. Hello? Katie, it's Charlene. Charlene went to her church and was one of the peacemakers, a quilting group that had formed in Sweetwater. Katie didn't groan, although she wanted to. She didn't want to be roped into doing some good deed for someone. She barely had enough energy to keep herself afloat, and she didn't want any do-gooders doing good deeds for her either. She just wanted to be left alone while the ship that was her life went down in a fiery mass of sinking ruin. Hi, Miss Charlene, she said, her voice sounding lackluster and depressed. Hopefully, Miss Charlene didn't feel like it needed to be corrected. I have something I want to talk to you about. 
I was wondering if you would have time to come to the church before your kids get home from school. Katie turned from the window, her gaze landing back on the dead plant. She wanted to think of an excuse, wanted there to be something she was doing that would keep her from stopping by the church, but she couldn't think of a thing. She'd been scheduled to work at the diner where she normally waitressed from the time her kids got on the bus until it was time to get them off. But today had been exceptionally slow, and after lunch, Miss Patty had sent her home. I can. She tried to keep the reluctance out of her voice. She had a feeling she wasn't successful. That's great. I'm not quite ready yet. Maybe in an hour and a half, maybe two. Katie looked at the clock. It was 12.30 now. If she made it there in an hour and a half, the ladies would still have an hour to talk to her before the kids got home from school. Two hours? Would that work? It would. If we need to talk to you a little longer, Daphne said she could be at your house when your kids get off the bus and let them know you'd be home soon. Katie sat down on the couch. There went that excuse. That's fine. She wanted to say she had to run to the grocery store or something. But although she could use groceries, she didn't have any money. Not if she wanted to make the mortgage payment and keep foreclosure at bay for one more month. For all the good that would do, since it had taken her six months to be able to scrounge up enough to pay one payment. Regardless, she had no excuse to say why she would have to be home when the bus got there so she kept her mouth closed and tried to visualize the idea that everything that had happened, every single thing, was working out for her good and God's glory. That almost seemed like a fantasy, although deep down somewhere, she still believed it. All right, we'll see you then. We also have a meal for you to take home, so don't cook anything for supper. The familiar feeling of her eyes filling with tears caused Katie to blink. She didn't feel like talking to anyone, didn't feel she was fit company for anyone. But the townspeople had been so good to her, and she hated that she just felt like crawling in a hole and dying rather than being kind like they deserved. Thank you, she said, sounding a little breathless but mostly because her throat was tight and she was trying not to cry. Folks had been so much kinder to her than she deserved. She could never pay them back for everything they'd done. Chapter 2 Love, Trust, and Respect for Each Other Richard Robinson, Florida Charlene looked at her watch, then looked at the church basement door again. Mav Stryker had been supposed to show up an hour ago, but he never had. Not that she, nor Kathy, nor Teresa, nor Vicky, the other ladies in the basement with her, fellow members of the Peacemakers, were surprised. Mav had grown up in Sweetwater, and they'd known him all his life. He'd always been a bit of a loose cannon, and that hadn't changed. While he had become more responsible as he got older, he was still a risk-taker and not the most dependable person. He'd probably forgotten he'd agreed to meet them. She wasn't going to text him again. After all, they had Flynn Powers coming in at 1.30. Your idea of giving Katie a choice bombed big time, Kathy said, her gaze leveled at Teresa who was the most conservative of the group. In fact, Teresa really shouldn't be a matchmaker, since she had issues with pretty much everything that had to do with matchmaking. The clandestine activities, the slight bending of the rules of society, the occasional need to give people a small push without letting them know. She called it lying, while Miss Charlene called it not letting your mouth run with everything you knew. Maybe something happened. Teresa sounded defensive. Regardless of whether something happened or not, the choice thing isn't going to work out, 
Not if we want to get this settled. Kathy held both hands out in front of her on top of the quilt she'd been piecing together. We have to get it settled. The bank is going to foreclose on her home if we don't do something. And Teresa was right. There were two men who were great options, and it would have been nice to give Katie a choice of either one. Especially since, if she agrees, she'll be making a lifetime commitment, too. Charlene's tone was firm, and the ladies settled. They didn't always agree on what steps they should take, but they always went along with what she decided would be best. She hoped she wasn't wrong this time. She couldn't think of another solution, nothing that would be better, anyway. She could use some stopgap measures, but nothing that would make Katie's future look any better than what it did now. She hadn't been sure about Mav to begin with, though, and it might have been a good thing that he didn't show up. She had no sooner thought that than the door opened, and both Mav and Flynn walked in. Mav's mouth went a mile a minute, while Flynn, tall and quiet, nodded beside him. His lips turned up just a little with a hint of a smile, but his movements much more controlled, his emotions more tightly under wraps than Mav's. Mav finished his story and laughed while Flynn's lips twitched, and he nodded. Sorry I'm late, ladies, Mav said, taking his cowboy hat off his head and giving a little bow. Always the drama king. Mav could have been ten years younger than the early thirties that he actually was. If they were giving Katie a choice, they couldn't have chosen two more different men. But, Charlene thought to herself, they were both good men. Mav might be more of a wild card, but he had a strong faith, and integrity and character, even if he was more likely to decide spur of the moment that he wanted to go to Hawaii and scuba dive, or become a bull rider, both of which he'd done. As far as Charlene knew, neither decision had led to much success, but only the bull riding had resulted in broken bones. Flynn, on the other hand, had a degree in accounting, one he'd earned entirely online, and one he used in his family's trucking company and feed mill business. Flynn's personality certainly suited his profession. Chapter 3 When All Else Fails, The Ability to Keep Your Promise Rhiannon, Texas Flynn stood back as Mav chatted with the peacemakers. He had never been great with small talk, and Mav was a real charmer. He didn't feel like he needed to say anything, and next to Mav, he always felt a bit stodgy. Still, he listened intently, paying attention to the conversation, even though he didn't necessarily understand why people always had such a deep fascination with the weather. But finally, Miss Charlene pulled back and glanced over at him before glancing back at Mav, including both of them in her next comments. We wanted to talk to you about one of the ladies in our town. I'm always down for talking about ladies, Mav said, humor in his voice as well as a little flirt. Charlene smiled like a schoolgirl and batted her eyes. Flynn kept from rolling his. Mav would flirt with a dead dog. Both of you are unmarried, and this woman needs a husband, and unfortunately, it must be quickly. She has three children, her husband left her, and I understand her divorce is final. She needs a husband. Flynn felt a bit of a shock in the pit of his stomach, but he couldn't deny he also felt intrigued. Dating had been, for the most part, an unmitigated disaster for him. He was too serious. He didn't entertain his dates. Boring. Didn't get the idea of small talk, and never seemed to be able to figure out what exactly it was a woman wanted. She's looking? Mav said, cracking his knuckles. No, 
I'm pretty sure she never wants to get married again. But she needs the support of a husband, since she got married right out of high school and has no way to support herself. You mean she's not interested in getting married again? Flynn questioned. Why were they trying to find her a husband if she wasn't interested in one? No, but I think that she would get married just because it's financially necessary. She needs a sugar daddy. I don't think I'm old enough for that, but yeah, I'm game. Mav laughed, and one of the ladies in the back tittered. I'm thinking this will be a marriage, as in a lifetime covenant, not just a temporary solution to her problems. So, while I suppose it could be looked upon as a sugar daddy situation, that's not what I'm thinking at all. I'm thinking real marriage, lifetime commitment. Miss Charlene, while she still had a twinkle in her eyes, crossed her arms over her chest and looked at both of them under her brows, as serious as she could be. Does she know about this? Flynn asked, then realized he had not asked the most important question. Who is it? Miss Charlene pressed her lips together. He couldn't hear it, but he was pretty sure her teeth were grinding as her jaw flexed just slightly. I don't want her name to leave this room, particularly if neither one of you is interested in my proposal. Agreed. Flynn didn't have a problem giving his word that he wouldn't say anything. He never blabbed stuff, especially things he was supposed to be saying, anyway. I guess I'll try not to say anything. Sometimes I forget what I promise to keep secret and what I'm allowed to talk about. Mav should have sounded like a jerk with that statement, but he accompanied it with a boyish grin that had all the ladies batting their eyes at him. Try to get it in your head that you're not allowed to talk about this. Although, after you've talked to her, if she's okay with it, you can be honest about what made you go to her. So, tell us who it is. I might be interested in her anyway, Mav said easily. Charlene lifted a brow at him, then she looked thoughtfully back over at Flynn. I assume I was correct in thinking that both of you men are ready to get married? Mav laughed. <laughs> That's one adventure I haven't embarked on. I suppose now is as good a time as any. Charlene nodded, although her gaze remained fixed on Flynn. He didn't give his answer right away. He supposed he'd wanted a wife for a while. At times, the longing was greater than at other times. But he'd never been able to get a girl to be interested in him long enough to propose marriage to her. Sadly, he, on the other hand, had been willing to settle for pretty much anyone, figuring that one woman was probably just about the same as any other. Although he didn't want to have one of those high-maintenance women who needed to be coddled and handled with kid gloves, he knew he was incapable of such behavior. He could barely figure out the basics. There was no way he would be able to handle someone who was complicated. You can take your time thinking about it if you want to, Flynn. I know this wasn't what you were expecting when you walked in today. Charlene finally broke the silence that had descended. Beside him, Mav fidgeted, shifting from one foot to the other and moving his hands, never still. Flynn noticed the difference. Next to Mav's more flamboyant personality, he was solid, steady as a rock. He worked with numbers, an accountant in his family's trucking and feed mill companies. He did the work of three people, and no one ever noticed or appreciated. And he never really cared. It was just work that needed to be done, and he was happy to contribute to what his family needed. Somehow, maybe in the back of his mind, he thought that maybe a wife would see what he did and appreciate it. Maybe that was just an impossible dream he had. Before he could answer, the door opened, and every head turned as Katie Lessing walked in. She paused before she closed the door, her eyes scanning the room. 
Surprise entered her expression as her gaze landed first on Mav, then switched to Flynn. It went back to Mav as she slowly closed the door. Then she looked at Miss Charlene. Was Katie the woman Charlene had been talking about? He could see the surprise on Mav's face as well. Katie was the girl next door, everyone's friend, but hardly beautiful, sensual, or anything that would be attractive to a man. Flynn had to admit he was glad he hadn't given Charlene an answer. He liked Katie. They'd even been good friends in junior high, when he was the only string player in the high school band. They'd hung out together, but just as friends. Flynn eventually spent more and more time in his family's business, working full-time by the time he graduated from high school. He didn't have time to hang out with the band members after school or football games. Still, he and Katie had some fun memories together. As friends, nothing more. For once, Mav seemed to be at a loss for words, and Miss Charlene as well. Flynn stood slightly closer to where Katie stood at the door, and he gave her a friendly smile. Hey, Katie. She tapped him lightly on the arm, greeting him in the way they might have if they were still in high school. Just friends. Hey there, Flynn. What's up? She asked, and if she didn't quite have the carefree expression of high school, if her eyes looked sad, and there were a few more lines on her face, and she looked careworn and beaten down, it was hardly evident under the friendly smile she gave. Her demeanor changed somewhat as she kept walking, and her smile seemed a little more sultry as she looked at Mav. Maverick? Katie, girl, it's a nice day to get married. Flynn wanted to close his eyes and rub his forehead. Mav was about as subtle as a herd of stampeding cows. Katie blinked, and it wasn't hard to see her head pull back in shock. I suppose I hadn't considered that. Her words were a little uncertain, giving him a bit of a raised brow as she continued walking. Now that Mav mentioned it, Charlene murmured as Katie stopped in front of her, it is a nice day to get married, and that's kind of what we invited you here for. She gave a bit of an exasperated look at Mav. I think I would have broken it to you a little bit more gently. Plus, I was thinking we would talk to the men first, and they would be gone by the time you got here. But Flynn couldn't make it any earlier, and someone else was late. She gave Mav another look while he gave her an endearing, boyish grin, which did not seem to sway Miss Charlene in the slightest. Miss Charlene took a breath in, glancing around the room before she blew it out. <sighs> I thought this was going to go down slightly differently, but here we are. We invited Mav and Flynn here today to talk to them about the possibility of getting married. Mav has said he's ready, and Flynn, which doesn't surprise any of us, is still thinking about it. Miss Charlene gave Flynn a small smile which he didn't exactly return, but his eyebrows moved. He supposed she didn't mean it as an insult, but she was basically calling him boring while presenting Mav as exciting and ready for a challenge, ready for anything. Still, he wasn't going to agree. Once he gave his agreement, he would be bound by his word. He didn't want to be bound to something that was going to be onerous or worse, impossible to keep so he closed his mouth and shoved his hands in his pockets, waiting. Katie, we understand that your situation is rather precarious, and while we can offer you help in the form of clothes for your kids, money for groceries, and whatever else you might need, there is a sense of security and definite benefits to having a husband. Health insurance, for one. Miss Charlene had Katie there because she had opened her mouth to protest, but she closed it at the mention of health insurance. The state would take care of her, but like most people in Sweetwater, she had been raised that a person depended on God, not the government. 
Neighbors were supposed to step in during times of need, while a person worked as hard as they could, doing everything they could to help themselves. When donations were necessary, his family, himself included, had always stepped forward. It wasn't long ago that they'd hosted an auction for Shasta, who eventually became his brother's wife. And that wasn't the only thing they'd done to help the people in town. Everyone else was the same. They looked out for each other. But for a woman who had three children and was working a minimum wage job, it took more than what the town could reasonably provide on an ongoing basis. Still, marriage seemed rather extreme and permanent. So, Miss Charlene clasped her hands in front of her and seemed to put on her most beguiling expression. We were hoping that you would consider one of these two gentlemen with whom to have a marriage of convenience. But while I didn't get a chance to talk to the men about it, marriage vows are binding, so it would be a marriage of convenience that would develop into a real marriage. That was our plan. Miss Charlene smiled as though trying to make the absurdity of her words make sense, just by the strength of her facial expression alone. It didn't work for Flynn, though Mav seemed to be caught up in it. That makes sense. Mav nodded his head. Flynn managed not to laugh because what Miss Charlene had just said was a lot of things, but sensible was not among them. I'm good with that. Mav shoved a hand in his back pocket and looked over at Katie. So basically what you're going to have Katie do is choose between Flynn and me as to which man she wants to marry? He directed his question to Charlene. That's right. Charlene gave a short nod. And you are under no pressure to decide today, although you certainly can if you want to. Flynn did not butt in and remind the ladies that he hadn't made his decision yet. He figured the point was probably moot, but also, he was a little concerned for Katie. Mav obviously was going about this in the surface-only way, and while he figured Mav would keep his word, Katie might be in for an interesting ride with him. Not to mention, she had three children to think of. Mav might make a good husband eventually, but there were a lot of rough edges to shave off. Flynn mentally laughed at himself. He probably had a lot of rough edges, too. He just couldn't see them. It was easier to judge another man and see his faults. A lot harder to judge himself and see his own. Katie bit her lip and looked between the two of them. The wrinkles in her brow indicated the fact that she was not comfortable with what Miss Charlene had asked her to do. I... I'm kind of surprised. Shocked, actually. I wasn't expecting to walk in here today and have to choose a husband. You don't have to choose anything. There are no have-tos about it. We just thought this would be a solution to your problem. And we have two bachelors who would make excellent husbands. Well, Flynn is like a friend to me. The idea of being married to him is a little repulsive. She gave Flynn a gentle smile. I'm sure you know what I mean. He did. He thought of Katie as a friend. And the idea of kissing her, well, he never actually thought of it. But the idea that she was dismissing him as husband material out of hand definitely made him feel like she'd just taken a sledgehammer to his ego. So I guess I would choose Mav, but he seems a little flighty, and I have children to think of. She sighed. Plus, I don't ever want to get married again. Marriage stinks. I can settle down. I don't have to be flighty. I'm planning on putting down roots, and I might as well do it now. Mav sounded like he was trying to talk her into him by saying he would change. Flynn wanted to throw up red flags, like a referee at a football game or something, because everyone knew that anyone who just changed because they wanted someone to love them, and not because they wanted to be a better person, wasn't changing for the right reason. Of course, 
Flynn had always considered that having a wife would make him a better man. But not because he changed for her to love him, but because her love changed him. Possibly, if he found a really great woman, loving her, having her support and admiration, her example and her belief in him, would change him too. But to his surprise, Miss Charlene didn't say anything. Katie shook her head. I'll have to think about it. I, I can see the wisdom in what you're suggesting, and I can't deny that I've almost reached the end of my rope. But I suppose I should ask for some godly advice before I make any decisions. You take as long as you need to. I understand about not wanting to be married again. I actually have a schedule written down as to how I think things should progress. Even if the marriage happens right away, there should be a courting time after the wedding. Miss Charlene smiled reassuringly while Flynn almost laughed out loud at the idea of there being a written schedule for a relationship progression. That sounded like something he would do. Something unemotional and black and white. Something that any woman he'd ever dated would complain about. They would say that romance should be spur of the moment and entirely based on their feelings, not according to some arbitrary schedule. Every single woman he had known, even if there hadn't been a lot of them, would have run screaming from him if he had suggested that. They wanted to base everything on romantic feeling. Even if he had rather decided over the course of his life that he didn't want to have those kinds of feelings, at least not in the way that women seemed to, he'd pretty much decided that he would never fall in love. He didn't like losing control, didn't appreciate being swept away by things he couldn't manipulate or handle. He liked to look at things objectively, have them make sense, and make rational decisions entirely free of any emotional bias. Maybe there was a happy middle ground somewhere, but he'd never been with anyone who was willing to help him find it. Once they realized he wasn't emotionally invested, they usually left him. He supposed it was just as well that Katie chose Mav. Hope everything works out for you guys, he said as he lifted his hand to wave goodbye. Katie held hers out for a fist bump, and instead of walking toward the door, he took a step toward her, gently knocking her knuckles with his. They shared a friendly smile and he knew that Katie hadn't meant to insult him or belittle him in any way. She just didn't have any feelings of attraction or romance toward him. He got that and shared it, even if it was embarrassing. Thanks for coming, Flynn, Miss Charlene said, and he jerked his head at her as he turned. Mav held out his hand for a handshake, and Flynn took it. You need to loosen up some, man. Mav murmured as they shook. Flynn let out a bit of breath in acknowledgement of his words, but he didn't say anything. Mav might be saying that now, but when he wanted to get his taxes done, he didn't want someone who would play fast and loose with the numbers. He wanted someone who cared about accuracy and precision, about analytics and details. He didn't want someone who was bebopping through life just enjoying it, caring more about having fun, and not worried about making sure the details were correct. Or, Flynn thought as he walked out the church door, maybe he was the one who was wrong. Chapter 4 Working Together as a Team Carol Dykstra, The Catskills of New York Katie watched Flynn go. The riot that had started in her stomach almost the second she walked in the church basement seemed to erupt into something much larger than her body could contain. Flynn's leaving made her feel slightly unbalanced, like as long as he was there, he would make sure that she was safe. Which was ridiculous, since, out of all of his brothers, Flynn was the least muscular and bulky. She hated to use the word feminine to describe him, but he'd always been quiet and serious, 
playing the viola in the high school band, along with all the woodwinds and brass and percussions. Their school hadn't been big enough to have an orchestra, but Flynn had fallen in love with the viola and hadn't wanted to switch to the French horn, like the band director had asked. So they gave him music, which he transposed into a C clef so he could play it on his viola, and he happily marched along with everyone else during football games and took his seat at the band concerts, playing his adjusted part. He'd always been different. Not in a bad way, just not really in a manly way. That wasn't entirely true. He was very much a man in the way he thought, but he was so methodical and particular. Traits that made him a great accountant, she was sure, and traits that also made him a great musician. Because while musicians needed to include expression in their music, which she had always been good at, the thing that had been difficult for her was counting and being exact with her timing. Flynn had excelled at that, and more than once had helped her count out difficult measures with tricky rhythms. Goodness, she hadn't played her clarinet in years, not since she started having children. Thinking about Flynn brought back all of those high school memories, memories where she was happy, carefree, and laughed a lot. She'd started her marriage out like that, but as Russell had grown more distant, working longer hours, leaving her home by herself, the natural joy that had always been a part of her personality had slowly gotten snuffed out as she was swamped with the care of three small children and as she fought the loneliness and isolation she felt at being neglected and ignored by her husband. She had stayed in her marriage because she vowed to do so, for better or for worse. And to her, a vow that said until death did them part meant that very thing. Except Russell hadn't kept his vow. She turned from the door, looking back at Mav, who hadn't stood still the entire time she'd walked in, shifting from one foot to another, cracking his knuckles, running his hand through his hair, and just in general fidgeting. Like a kid. She had no doubt he'd do his best to keep his vow. What she doubted was whether or not she wanted to get married again. Although, there was something intriguing about just getting married and not getting her emotions involved. If she were being honest, her emotions were already involved, because she found Mav more romantically attractive than she did Flynn. Even though her head knew Flynn was the better pick, just because he was steady and reliable and rock solid. Maybe she shouldn't have been so hasty to choose. So, how long you think it's going to take you before you decide whether or not you want to get married? I don't know. She tried to sound more confident than what she actually felt. She felt scared, particularly since Flynn walked out. There was a steadiness about him that... While he wasn't masculine with testosterone oozing from every pore, he gave the impression that he would do exactly what he said he would and wouldn't renege or cheat. She knew both of those things to be true after having been friends with him. More than once, other members of the band had tried to convince him to go along with some of their wilder schemes, and he'd always bowed out, never judged them, but never went along with anything that might be considered doubtful or the slightest bit wrong. She kind of wished they hadn't grown apart, because maybe he would have given her honest and good advice about Russell. Of course, she hadn't been willing to listen to anyone who told her that Russell, while handsome and good-looking and embodying all the masculine characteristics that Flynn lacked, also lacked character and integrity and basic honesty. A marriage of convenience is, by definition, something that benefits both parties, and you go into it thinking logically rather than romantically. Can you make a vow that will last a lifetime? Does the person that you're vowing to have character, and will they keep their vows? Do you have the same values and morals? 
Will he love your children and raise them as his own? Does he want more children? Charlene shrugged her shoulders. Those are the things that you should be thinking about. Attraction and romance are really not something that you need to be taking into consideration. That type of thing will grow and come naturally if you decide to be together. She sounded so confident. Everything she said made Katie think that maybe she'd been thinking about choosing the wrong man. Not that Mav didn't have great character and integrity, but Flynn was the one she could depend on. I'll let you know by tomorrow this time, and I guess at that time you can let me know if you're still interested. Mav nodded, then he held out his hand for a fist bump. It felt a little odd, since a fist bump was something she did with her friends, and not with someone who felt like a stranger. Still, their knuckles touched. Then she waved to the ladies, taking the casserole from Miss Teresa with a murmured thank you, and turned around and walked out. She had just enough time to go visit Cassie, her neighbor who had been diagnosed with leukemia. She wasn't even 25, and since she lived right next door to Katie, Katie made a point of visiting her. Her husband's infidelity and her subsequent divorce had kept her from being as much of a support as she wanted to be, but she remembered as she was walking out that yesterday was the day of her scheduled treatments. And normally the day after them, Cassie was exhausted, barely able to get out of bed. With time to spare before her kids would get off the bus, and with her shift at the diner canceled, Katie parked her car in her own drive and strode over to Cassie's house, walking up the porch steps. Cassie's dog, Phyllis, barked as she knocked on the door. Knowing that Cassie was probably on the couch, she tried the knob, which was unlocked. Opening the door, she stuck her head in and yelled, Hello, the house! Phyllis, some kind of small mixed breed, stopped barking as she ran up and sniffed at Katie's leg. Katie heard a groan coming from the living room, which might have been a come in, but it was mumbled and low enough that she couldn't tell for certain. Closing the door and petting Phyllis on the head, she straightened and walked in. Cassie? I'm sorry. I was getting up to answer the door. You don't have to. I don't want you to. I just wanted to come in and check on you. I hope I didn't wake you. No. Cassie said, the word a little choked, and Katie's face scrunched up, reflecting her feeling of helpless desire to do something, anything, to help, but she couldn't. It sounds like you don't want anything to eat. No, I just feel miserable. The idea of, of food. She groaned. I'm sorry. Not your fault. God loves me. That's why I'm going through this. There was irony in Cassie's voice, but Katie knew there was a deep, abiding faith that was upholding Cassie during this time. They had spent many hours talking about her illness and her feelings and why God was allowing this in her life. Cassie struggled to sit up. Please, you don't have to get up. I just wanted to check on you. I had to run to the church, and I have a little bit of time before the kids get out of school. Cassie slowly brought her legs around until she sat on the couch, her shoulders slumped, her face white and translucent as a piece of paper, but her eyes still filled with loving care. No work? No, they canceled my shift at the diner. As she spoke, panic wrapped around Katie's backbone and she tried with all her might to shut it down. Things are that slow? Cassie lifted her brows. She knew exactly how badly Katie needed that job. She had no training, no experience, and no way to find something else that would support her. If she lost her waitressing job, she would have no choice but to move back in with her parents. She might end up doing that anyway, since waitressing hadn't been enough to pay her bills. Yeah, it always is in the winter. It was spring and had been for several months, but Cassie didn't correct her. I go eat there, Cassie murmured, 
she didn't need to say if she were well. She could afford to, since she had her own business designing tiny houses. She had started it online directly out of college and had been wildly successful. Then she'd gotten cancer. Thankfully, she had money saved, and she was able to work two or three days a week. Never on the day after a treatment, but after she rested for a day or two. I know you would, but you don't need to. God will work something out. Sit down. Talk to me for a bit. Cassie's voice was hoarse, her words whispered, but she smiled as Phyllis jumped up on the couch and cuddled down in her lap. Her hand, thin with blue veins showing, reached carefully to pet her beloved friend. Are you sure you're up to a visit? Katie asked, knowing she had a few minutes before her kids came home and she'd love to chat. Yes, I'd love to talk to someone. I've been alone all morning, and while I feel terrible, I really like the company. She took a breath, just like talking made it hard to breathe. Although, I might not be able to talk much. Katie understood a little about how that was. Too tired to talk, feeling sick, but just wanting the company of another human for a bit. Without the stomach sickness, she felt like that during her divorce at times. Overwhelming loneliness, where she just wanted someone, some kind of human contact, something to let her know that she wasn't as worthless and disgusting as she felt. So pathetically unlovable that her husband, the man who knew her better than any person on earth, didn't want her. At that point, Katie figured she might as well tell Cassie what had been going on that morning and what was jumbling around in her head. Could she really marry a man she barely knew? I told you I was at the church. The peacemakers wanted to talk to me. It's a little early for them to match you up, isn't it? Have your divorce papers come? Cassie gave her a compassionate glance knowing that the D word was likely to trigger feelings of inadequacy and deep, abiding sadness. They're sitting on my kitchen table right now. I haven't signed them, but I'm going to. Katie tried to make the words sound comforting rather than sad and depressed, and like her entire world had fallen apart and the divorce papers just proved it. No, they weren't exactly matching me up. They suggested a marriage of convenience. Today? Soon. They wanted me to use logic and think about the situation analytically rather than using romance. They didn't say, but I suspect they know I'm way behind on my mortgage, and if something doesn't happen, I'm going to lose the house. They were just offering me a solution I'd never thought of. That's because normal people don't approach marriage with rational thoughts and view it analytically. I know, but maybe we'd be better off if we did. What they said made some sense. Find a man with character, one with integrity, and one who will keep his vows. One that you can be friends with and worry about the romance part later. Completely backward from the way we usually do it. I know. <laughs> Where do you find the man of character? Cassie's voice was still soft and weak, but she chuckled a little, and Katie laughed humorlessly with her. If she had considered that having character was an important quality before she got married the first time, she never would have given Russell the time of day. After all, he cheated on his girlfriend with Katie, which Katie took to mean that he liked her more than he liked his girlfriend. And in her immaturity, she had almost considered it a point of pride. It hadn't occurred to her to think that if he would cheat on his girlfriend, he would cheat on her, too. They had two suggestions. Suggestions? I guess that isn't the exact right word, since the men they wanted me to consider were actually standing in the church. Awkward. I know. Except one was Flynn, so that wasn't a big deal. 
you guys used to be friends? We went to school together, and yeah, we were good friends. We played in the band together. Well, I played in the band, he played viola in the band, and was always just a little different. But you liked that. <laughs> I did. Katie smiled, knowing that Cassie had heard her more than once say that she liked being just a little different. Normally, when she'd said that in the past, she'd been talking about getting married right out of high school and having her children early, versus what the rest of the world did, which was wait until they were in their 30s before they got married and had kids. She liked bucking the trends, but it had bitten her. So, who's the other man? Mav Stryker, Katie said, and a picture of Mav, his carefree grin, his devil-may-care attitude, and his aura of irresponsibility popped into her brain. That was probably why it took her a second or two to see the shocked and dismayed expression on Cassie's face, the expression that Cassie struggled to hide. Chapter 5 Give and take. Do something nice for each other every day. Sally Scully, Iowa Katie's brows drew down, and her mind started to shift, toying with the idea that Cassie might have feelings for Mav. It wasn't hard to see that she had a reaction to Mav's name. I know you know him. Yeah, he's a lot older than me. He's done some bull riding, been to Hawaii. I think he's even worked on the ice roads in Alaska. Yeah, he's done all of that, as well as harvested sugar beets in South Africa. And he was in the Australian outback for a while as well. You know a lot about him. I guess. You like him. It's a childish crush. Katie sat with her mouth closed. There was no way she would choose Mav, not when her friend had a crush on him. Especially Cassie, who had so little to be helpful about. She wouldn't take the idea that Mav might someday notice her away from Cassie. She just couldn't. Even if, knowing Mav the way she did, she was almost certain that Mav would never notice Cassie. Cassie was successful in her business because she could sit behind a computer and do everything she needed to do. In real life, she was the shyest person Katie had ever met. Mav, with his bumbling, devil-may-care personality, would never notice or appreciate someone like Cassie. Not because he was mean or uncaring, but just because he wasn't the kind of person who stopped to notice the little things. And unless he deliberately trained himself to do that, which Katie had a hard time picturing Mav doing, he never would. Did she want to be married to someone like that? As she thought of that question, Flynn's face came into her mind. Solid and dependable, deliberate. He more than noticed the details. He worked in the details. Although, if there was anyone who was ever unemotional, it was Flynn. Did she want to be married to a man who might never love her? They had teased him in high school because while he never got upset, he never cared deeply about anything either. But then she thought about his music, how he pulled beauty and expression from the strings as he played. Almost effortlessly, it seemed, and she couldn't listen to him without her heart being stirred and feeling the music clear down to her soul. That had always made her feel like he was deeper than he seemed, and maybe just couldn't stand the idea of emotions because he couldn't control them, not because he didn't feel them. She forgot about that until just now. Which one are you going to choose? Cassie prompted after Katie had been quiet way too long. Flynn. The word came out without her thinking about it. Did she mean that? Actually, while he was standing there, 
I said that I only felt friendship toward Flynn and wouldn't even consider him as a husband. Why? Cassie asked. For the first time, there was strength behind her words. He knew what I meant, just that I liked him for a friend. That's what we've always been. You know, the idea of kissing him is like kissing my brother. Who was standing there when you said that? Cassie's voice was slightly less strident, but she still sat straight, her brows drawn in, her face twisted. Cassie, it's just Flynn. He feels the same way about me. I wasn't insulting him. You were in private, right? No, Mav and the peacemakers were there, but they all know how I feel about Flynn. I love him like a friend. I want to argue with you, because I think you probably hurt his feelings. Her voice had lowered, and she leaned back against the couch like her small outburst had completely drained her of any energy. Normally, Katie would have leaned forward and put her hand on her knee and asked her to take it easy. But her words had brought Katie up short, made her think. Had she hurt Flynn's feelings? Flynn didn't have feelings. Feelings and emotions were two different things. He wasn't emotional, but that didn't mean he didn't have pride, that he didn't feel things, right? I didn't mean to. I never thought. I, the last thing I want to do is to hurt someone's feelings, especially someone that I admire and like as much as Flynn. It was true. While in the last decade since Katie's marriage, they hadn't really spent much time together, they'd been pretty close in high school, as close as two people could be without being romantically involved. And she truly did like and admire him, respect him, and love him, like a friend, of course. I believe you, just sometimes we don't think. That's true. I'd like to think that with everything I've gone through with Russell, I've become more considerate. It's been a really hard experience, but at least it's made me more aware of other people's pain. At least, I thought it had. You're beating yourself up about it. Don't. You didn't mean to hurt him, and you can apologize if you did. Flynn's the kind of man who will accept your apology and forgive you immediately. He's not going to be holding anything against you, or worse, trying to pay you back. That was a lot of words for Cassie, and she was out of breath by the time she was done, even though she spoke slowly and quietly. I didn't mean to come here and get you all upset. You're not. I feel needed. I feel like an actual human being, instead of a big pile of sick dew. Katie hesitated. She wanted to make sure she was right about Cassie, even though she'd pretty much changed her mind on her own about Mav. She didn't want to upset Cassie in her weakened condition. But if Cassie really did want to feel like a human being, maybe she wouldn't mind a little girl talk. How long have you had a crush on Mav? Cassie huffed out a breath, the closest thing to a laugh she'd come all day. <laughs> I think I was born crushing on him. Katie laughed. Seriously, it's funny. Since he's outgoing, goofy, friendly, and everybody is his friend, sometimes he veers a little bit into hurting people on accident because he's clueless, but I see so much potential in him. Always have. You're the opposite. You're so sensitive and kind, quiet, always seeing other people, although you help so unobtrusively because you hate the spotlight just as much as he loves it. Is that true? It must be a case of me being attracted to my opposite. And you've never said anything. 
No, I've never even really talked to him. Just once. But I'm not sure he noticed me at all. Certainly, it did nothing but fuel my attraction. While he seemed oblivious to the fact that I was even a human. I'd ask you about it, but talking seems to tire you. Someday, I'll tell you. Cassie closed her eyes, and Katie felt like it was just as much an embarrassment as it was an exhaustion. In the meantime, tell me what you're going to do. I'm going to choose Flynn. Because she would never choose Mav. But while the idea of a marriage of convenience had been shocking when the peacemakers had first presented it, she'd kind of gotten used to the idea. It might be hard to explain to her kids, but she liked the idea of not facing the future by herself, not having to go back to her family. My parents have been married for decades. Every one of my siblings has a strong marriage. I'm the only one that's divorced. I don't want to go back to my parents, so the idea of a marriage of convenience, while it was shocking to begin with, actually seems like a good thing. She sighed. Do you think the town's going to think I'm crazy? Or desperate, running from man to man with the ink barely dry on my divorce papers? Actually, I haven't even opened them yet. Life doesn't always go the way we want it to. Immediately, Katie felt bad for complaining to Cassie of all people. After all, nobody in Katie's family had cancer when they were under 30 years old. I know. Cassie had been a great example to her. Sometimes I wonder why God lets these things happen. I mean, your husband cheating on you was not your fault, no matter what he might say, Cassie said gently. I know, it's hard to believe, because not only does he say it, but I feel it, feel like a failure, like, like... I could have done something more, been a better wife, maybe if I had written notes and put them in his lunchbox, or if I were prettier, skinnier, or if I had lost the baby weight faster, or if I hadn't nursed my babies, or if I washed his clothes every day instead of every other day, or ironed his t-shirts better, or not being so tired when he came home from work even though I'd been up all night and had the kids all day. No, don't do that to yourself. He should have been helping you. You had a job that never ended. He had a job that was only eight hours a day. I didn't know that. He was working a lot longer, Katie said, using her fingers to put air quotes around the word working. Because... He hadn't been working at all. If he were a man of character, it wouldn't matter what you did or didn't do. If there had been a problem, you two could have talked about it, and you could have figured it out together. But he never told you that there was any kind of problem. You had no idea. That was true. He had never mentioned there were any issues at all. I guess I just need someone to tell me that over and over, because there is this voice in my head that continuously tells me I'm lacking. How come I can't keep my husband? And a worse voice asking God where he's been and why he didn't make sure that Russell had done right. If God loved my kids... Wouldn't he have made sure they had a father who loved them and cared about them enough to stay? We can't make other people have character, and you don't want him to stay if he's just going to lie and cheat behind your back. It's a good thing you found out, and I know God has something better in store for you. A marriage of convenience? Just the very idea sounded terrible, like there was no love or romance involved. 
And maybe her heart was hurting, shriveled and tender, and only a shell of what it used to be. But it was still a woman's heart, with a woman's desire for romance. And it wanted to be pursued, to be cherished, to be wanted. To be thought beautiful and lovely and all the desires God had given her. Why does God allow us to want things that we can't have? It was a rhetorical question, and of course, Cassie didn't have an answer. That's a good question. Why do I want to be healthy? Why do I want to not have cancer? Why do I want to be able to work and not have to rest after a few minutes in front of the computer? I feel like I'd be better off if I stop chasing the things I want and if I start appreciating and reaching for the things that God wants me to have. Just how do I make myself want what God wants for me? Isn't that submission to his will, where we give up what we want and we give our desires and our expectations and our dreams and goals to God and just say, your will, not mine. Simple words, but so much harder to do than what you think. Katie thought about what a struggle it was for her to give up the dreams and hopes and goals she had, the stars in her eyes and the romance in her heart. I think I can give up to God a lot easier if he'd just let me know that he was going to give me something I wanted and not expect me to be happy with something else. Like a parent giving their kid broccoli to eat when they'd rather have cake. Exactly. That's a great example, too, because kids think cake is a great treat, and they don't realize that it might taste good, but it's not good for them while the broccoli will help them grow and develop the way they should, even if it doesn't taste as good. But no kid wants broccoli over cake. They both sat silently, thinking about that for a bit. Cancer, divorce, rejection, exhaustion, and sickness. Those things were all broccoli. But was affection and love, romance and health, Energy and a loving relationship really like cake? Feel good stuff, but not good for them? Katie just couldn't believe it was so. Maybe moderation was the key. Maybe like cake, which was bad for a person all the time. Maybe too much of life being perfect kept a person's character from growing. There was no struggle, there was no strife. If there were no times of depression and discouragement, then a person never understood, truly understood, their deep and abiding need for God and his strength and his power and his love. Maybe if my relationship had gone the way it was supposed to, the way I wanted it to, maybe I had my husband in place of God, where I relied on him and loved him and depended on him rather than on God, and I wouldn't have realized that if things had gone the way I wanted. Maybe she needed to think about that more. Maybe God needed to give her divorce and the relationship issues she had because he wanted to be first in her life. Maybe he needed to take away her dreams so he could awaken her to her need to depend on him. Maybe he needed to allow her marriage to dissolve because of the pride she took in the fact that no one in her family was divorced. Maybe she put too much of her identity in her marriage and being part of a two-parent home, a regular nuclear family. Cassie's eyes closed and her head leaned back on the couch. I better go. I need to pick my kids up. Cassie cracked her eyes open. Are you thinking about doing what the peacemaker suggested with Flynn? She asked as she slowly stood. I am. Maybe that's the kind of marriage I need. Cassie's mouth flattened. Your husband needs you to love him, 
he needs to be admired and respected. I want you to make him a priority and let him know you care. I think that's where you're wrong. Flynn won't. He's rock solid, steady, and unemotional. He'll understand that I can't give a husband so much control over me again. Katie was sure she was right about Flynn. She remembered teasing him about how unemotional he was. He would be fine with emotional distance from her. She was sure of it. Chapter 6 Making Your Spouse Feel Valued Show that they are important to you by spending quality time with them. Karen Arms, Poplar Bluff, Missouri Flynn lowered his viola from his chin and looked around the small living area in the apartment he lived in above his family shop. He was the only one of his brothers not married and the only one still living above the garage. Their dad had put apartments in years ago, mostly for drivers who might have a truck in the shop and didn't live close enough to drive home. It had ended up that a few of his brothers, and Flynn as well, had lived in them for a while. It wasn't ideal, but it suited Flynn just fine. He didn't need anything fancy, and the small living room, the kitchen-dining room combo, and the minuscule bedroom was enough for him. He spent most of his waking hours at the shop anyway. He fingered his viola. Katie had texted ten minutes ago and asked if she could come over. Checking his watch, he figured Katie would be pulling in in about 90 seconds if she left when she said she was going to. It would take him 72 seconds to set his viola down and walk out of his apartment and down the stairs to the garage man door. He didn't want to get there as she was just pulling in and then stand awkwardly in the doorway waiting for her to get out of her car. He wanted to time it so he got to the door after she had already gotten out of her car and was walking toward the garage. He had no sooner thought that than a knock echoed through the lower interior of the garage. Flynn had left his door open, and he heard it easily. Either they had an unexpected visitor at nine o'clock in the evening, or, more likely, Katie was early. He hated it when he misjudged things. Taking the stairs two at a time, he jumped to the door, and that's why he arrived, winded, as he opened it. Oh! Katie exclaimed, her hand raised in preparation to knock again. I wasn't sure which door to go to. This was fine. I just wasn't expecting you for another 29 seconds. Humor lit her eyes while Flynn wished he could take the words back. Normal people didn't time their guest's arrival down to the second. He knew he had some odd tendencies, and he tried as hard as he could to cover them. You want to come upstairs, or do you want to talk in the office down here? Do you live upstairs? Katie tilted her head like the thought hadn't occurred to her. He wasn't sure why else he would have asked her to meet him at the garage. It wasn't like that was where he normally met women or something. Yeah, there are a few apartments upstairs, and I moved out of Dad's house and up here five years ago. Or so. He added the or so after a pause. It had actually been four years and nine months but at least this time, he had stopped himself before he made another faux pas and told Katie down to the day how long he'd been living in his current place. Oh, so you're not going to tell me how many years, months, weeks, and days it's been? She walked around him. He gave her a sour look before he turned and walked toward the stairs. She fell in step beside him, but he didn't look at her again. She knew him better than most people did, even if they hadn't talked over the last decade. She didn't seem bothered by his idiosyncrasies, although apparently they bothered her enough that she had chosen Mav over him. And that was the reason he was nervous. Why was she here? Her text had been cryptic, just asking to meet. At his place, 
since apparently the neighbor was watching her children. At the stairs, he stepped aside and allowed her to go first. She gave him an uncertain glance, then grabbed the rail and started up. I left my door open. The light spilled out, illuminating the dim garage, where just one light below by the tool chests gave a dim glow over the whole area. One truck sat in each bay, giving the illusion of deep darkness on their side of the garage. It made his apartment look welcoming, when he knew for a fact it wasn't. Not the way Katie would want it to look. He knew her well enough to know that she decorated all of her boring brown book covers in school with flowers and horses and rainbows. She decorated her locker with pictures and knickknacks. She always had something cute in her hair, and her outfits were original and frilly, without being excessive. He liked her style okay, actually enjoyed seeing pretty things at times, although he felt no need for that for himself, even if he had any idea of how to do it. Katie stepped carefully into his apartment, then stood in front of the door while he walked in behind her. He left the door open just because. Whatever she wanted to say, he didn't want her to feel trapped and he didn't want to give any semblance of impropriety. Not that he was expecting anyone else to arrive at the garage this time on a Saturday night. Katie's hands twisted in front of her, and he glanced down at them before he looked up. I don't have a whole lot of selection of drinks, just water, coffee, and some milk, but it might be expired. <laughs> I'm fine. I don't need anything. You want to sit down? He nodded over to the couch, which was his only piece of furniture. Her eyes followed his, and her frown deepened. But then she smiled. There's your viola. Yeah, if I get off work early enough, sometimes I play it in the evening. Sometimes he took it outside. Anything special? I've been working through box cello suites. I worked backward through them because number one is my favorite. Some of my favorite music. I forgot you liked it. I haven't touched my clarinet since the kids were born, but I still love the music. He nodded. He had a ton of memories of them being in band together. Memories he hadn't thought of in years. The other kids had always wanted to play pop music, and the band director had often indulged them but they still played enough classical music to satisfy the longing in his soul, at least. There was something about music that made him feel things he couldn't feel, or maybe allowed him to express feelings he couldn't, or maybe just wouldn't express without it. He'd never really examined himself that much to figure out what it was. He just knew there was a place in his soul that needed the music. I guess kids take a lot of time. That felt like small talk to him, banal and irrelevant, but he didn't know what else to say. They do. I, sometimes I wonder if that was part of the problem in my marriage. My husband wanted more time than I had to give him. Seems to me that if a man has kids, he should be helping to take care of them not leaving his wife home alone with them while he runs around with another woman. But maybe that's just me. He had zero sympathy for Russell. Any man who would do what Russell had done deserved no mercy and had no excuses. It didn't matter how terrible his wife had been, and Katie was far from terrible. A man who would walk out on his kids and wife and take up with another woman should be shot, in Flynn's opinion. Katie smiled like she appreciated his words. Then she shrugged. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. He waited. She didn't want anything to drink. She hadn't moved to sit down. And she seemed uncomfortable. It was enough to make him nervous. And his palms started to itch. Is there something I can do for you? He asked, after waiting a few seconds while she fidgeted. About what the peacemaker said. 
she lifted her eyes, blinking up at him. He stared at her, wondering what exactly she meant. Was she asking for a character reference on Mav? There were tons of people in town who knew Mav better than he did. Mav's brothers, for example. One of his older brothers, Clay Preacher, was known as a straight shooter and would never lie, and could give anyone the lowdown on Mav's flaws, as well as how he had changed over the years. You want me to tell you what I know about Mav? He asked uncertainly. No! Her eyes got wide, like she couldn't believe he thought she'd be asking him about that. Then she grimaced. I'm sorry. My guess you had no idea why I wanted to come. No, he said simply. Especially since I was pretty clear while everyone was standing there that I didn't want you. She hesitated on those last few words, like she realized that maybe what she had said hadn't been the kindest. He shrugged. Life? I'm sorry. When I told Cassie about it, she suggested that maybe I could have been a little kinder, and I'm sorry. I didn't realize at the time how it was coming off. I guess I was just flabbergasted at what Miss Charlene had suggested, but the idea was kind of floating around in my head, whirling more like it, and I was starting to like it, which scared me. It's a crazy idea. I've never heard of anyone getting married that way. Actually, Rem and Elaine did, Katie said, naming a couple that lived half an hour outside of Sweetwater. That had been a decade ago, but all of Sweetwater knew their story. And as Katie had pointed out, their marriage had indeed been a marriage of convenience. He couldn't believe he'd forgotten. You can't tell it now. They must have had some kind of relationship going on beforehand. As I've heard it, they got married the day after they met. That's actually what he had heard, too. The way I'm thinking, we have an advantage over them because we've been friends for years. Wait, what? He shook his head. He'd gotten sidetracked thinking about a marriage of convenience and how that just wasn't done in society anymore, although he wouldn't mind trying it. It would save him from all of the hassle of trying to figure out what in the world women wanted on a date and beyond. But Katie had just said, we. Oh, I guess I didn't say. Say what? Say what I came for. I apologize. I didn't mean to dismiss you out of hand. Didn't want to insult you. I'm afraid that's what I did. It's fine. He brushed it aside. There was no way he was going to admit that what she had done had hurt him. No way. I thought it had. I'm sorry. He hated that. Her crazy way of reading his mind and knowing how he felt, even when he didn't say. He didn't mean that. He didn't hate it. He appreciated it. He had a tendency to be very literal and to take people's words as exactly how they meant them. And he wouldn't say that he lied because when he said it didn't hurt, it's because he didn't want to hurt. He supposed there was a difference, but it was the same thing in his head. Are you going to accept my apology? She asked, biting her lip. It wasn't necessary, but I accept. She took a deep breath, like what she was going to say was making her nervous. After thinking about it, while Mav seems like the more romantic choice, romantic in a schoolgirl not being responsible, I always make the wrong decision kind of way, her eyes glinted at him, and he lifted a brow, allowing a bit of humor to enter his expression, but waiting. And you are already a friend, Although the idea of being romantic is a little scary, if not repulsive? He jerked his head. Always nice to know that a woman found him repulsive physically. He didn't say anything, 
figuring that his sarcasm wouldn't go over well. But you are the smarter choice. It was easy to see that after I walked out. Are you still willing? He had never told the peacemakers he was willing to begin with. He hadn't agreed. He had agreed to think about it, not to do it. He hadn't wanted to give his word when he wasn't sure he could keep it. But now, looking into Katie's eyes, the words came easily, and he knew he meant them and would stand behind them, even if she found him repulsive. After all, he considered her a friend, and there wasn't much he wouldn't do for his friends, including marry them, it seemed like. I am. Good. Her relief was obvious as she blew out a breath, and her face relaxed. My neighbor, Cassie, the woman who has cancer, I visited her yesterday, and when I mentioned that Mav was one of my two choices, I could tell there was something going on. Don't tell anyone, but she has a crush on him. There was no way I could go through with marrying him when my friend likes him. I just couldn't. Especially when he really doesn't mean that much to me. He's just more attractive, I guess. Chapter 7 A lot of laughter and assuming the best of your partner. Katie from Salt Lake City Flynn's jaw flexed and he ground his teeth together. Katie wasn't making it any better. It was deflating to know that he was her second choice out of two. And it kind of made her apology moot because she just insulted him again. He would deny it hurt because he didn't want it to. But it cut, especially because this was the woman he had just told he was willing to marry. And she was telling him that she wanted someone else but was settling for him because her friend had a crush on her first choice. It didn't exactly make a man feel appreciated or wanted. But maybe that's how Katie felt when her husband had chosen another woman over her. I did it again, didn't I? She said suddenly. Did what? I made you feel bad. She closed her eyes and shook her head. I'm sorry. I have so much stuff jumbled up in my head. Fear about my kids, the nagging baggage about how my husband doesn't think I'm good enough, which prompts the thought, who do I think I am thinking I can go into another marriage and make a man happy? Stop. It's not your job to make anyone happy. It's just your job to be the best wife you can be. If the man that you're with, the man you're married to, doesn't appreciate it, that's his deal. You're good enough. He wasn't in love with her, but he hated to see her hurt, because he did love her as a friend. He supposed kissing her wouldn't be a hardship, but he probably wouldn't say that to her. After all, she probably wanted to feel a little bit special, since, to his surprise, he did too. I know, I know you're right. It's just hard. Is that going to be a problem? He asked, somehow thinking that if she went into the marriage assuming she wasn't going to be good enough for him, she would be struggling for a long time. I don't think so. I know the facts. You know how you have head knowledge, but you just can't get your feelings to line up the way they're supposed to? He was tempted to nod, just for the sake of agreeing with her, but he didn't. No, I really don't. He made his feelings be what he wanted them to be. He didn't go around being a slave to how he felt. Of course not. You're the most unemotional person I've ever met. Thanks. He wasn't sure that was a compliment, but it was probably the truth. Even for a man, he was rather unemotional. Ugh, keep putting my foot in my mouth. Maybe you've changed your mind and think you'd be better off without me. I think you know I don't change my mind. That wasn't entirely true. 
Occasionally, someone would point out something that he hadn't realized before, which would cause his opinion to shift. But he didn't do it without logic and reason. Certainly, he didn't do it based on his emotions. I know. She looked down at the floor, and he remembered what one of his former dates had said about wanting him to be more invested in her, to care. She didn't understand that he did care. He just didn't know how to show it. Hey. He reached out and touched her shoulder. It shocked her, and she jerked, and his hand dropped. Her eyes, wide, flew to his. Maybe he wasn't supposed to touch her. He wasn't sure what else that would mean. Do you want to go sit down? He asked again, because he wasn't sure what else to say. He kind of wanted to know what the issue was, but how did he ask that and get her to answer him? This time, she nodded, and he directed her over to the couch. He noticed her eyes going to his viola, and he was a little tempted to offer to play it for a bit, since he hadn't put it back in its case. But he didn't. She probably didn't have much time. She mentioned the neighbor watching her kids and her coming directly from her shift at Patty's. You must be tired. I am. I don't usually work Saturdays, and I hardly ever work all day. But things were slow this week, and I wanted to get as many hours in as I could. If we get married, you can cut your hours, right? Her eyes flew to his, scared. No. She closed her eyes and breathed in as though to calm herself. I don't want to depend on a man again. I wouldn't be in this position if I hadn't thought that my husband was going to take care of me and I was going to take care of the house and kids. I thought that was our agreement. I didn't realize he was going to dump me and I was going to land so hard. He nodded slowly, understanding where she was coming from. It would be a scary thing to be completely dependent on someone else, especially if the people around you had a history of not keeping their word. You will admit there is a difference between Russell and me, though, right? He pushed a little, gently, because he wanted her to admit that if he said he was going to take care of her, she could trust him to do it. Is it terrible that I'm afraid to trust, even though I know you're trustworthy? She asked, her face crinkled. Then she shook her head. Maybe that just shows I'm not ready to get married again. If you can push your feelings aside, your logic tells you I am trustworthy. She nodded, her eyes closing as though she were mentally berating herself for allowing her feelings to get in the way of what she knew to be true. I won't push you to do what I want, but I try hard not to say things I don't mean. I know. I remember that. You always were honest and careful to make sure that if you said it, you did it. She gave a little smile. That's one of the things I really appreciate about you. One of the things that makes you very different from Russell. I'd like to be as different from Russell as I can possibly be. He supposed Russell was bigger, bulkier, looking more like a movie star and less like a regular Joe. While Flynn was very much a regular Joe. He knew it. If one overlooked his odd quirks, he could be any man USA. I guess after what I went through with him, I'll probably have some hang-ups. Is, is that going to be a problem? No. As long as she admitted that she had hang-ups, and as long as he could talk to her rationally, they would be fine. I thought, I've never done this before, but I thought if we were really going to get married, we ought to figure out how that would look. She glanced up at him, questions in her eyes. This was the type of thing he could really go to town on. Immediately, his brain latched a hold of the idea and thought about logistics, things that would need to be consolidated, plans for how they would make things work logistically, 
and he felt comfortable for the first time since she walked in the door. We should have a joint checking account, and you can keep any money that's in just your name. No money should go into any account with Russell's name on it. No, obviously. He wasn't sure if that was obvious or not, and he wanted to make sure. He was fine supporting his wife. His wife? Wow. Was he really agreeing to this? Some part of his brain felt surreal, while the part of his brain that loved making plans and taking action took over. If the house is in just your name, we should live there. Otherwise, we'll have to find a place. There really wasn't any equity in the house, so I was supposed to take over the payments. She grimaced and looked down at her hands, which were clenched in her lap, the knuckles white. I've been trying to sell it, but I haven't been able to and can't lower the price any further. I'm six months behind on payments. He blinked. That probably shouldn't surprise him. The waitress didn't earn that much, and he'd heard that one of her kids had been in the emergency room. She probably had bills and high deductibles to pay. He didn't question it, although he supposed they needed to get the finances figured out. Are there any issues that I need to know about? Gambling? Shopping addictions? He didn't want to insult her, but he also didn't want to be blindsided. He waited for her to meet his eyes. She had always been honest, and he didn't think she would lie to him now. No, none. Russell fought me about paying child support, and he was able to get the judge to lowball it. Raymond fell and broke his arm, and I ended up being responsible for all the deductibles and co-insurance. It hurt. Yeah, I thought I'd heard that. That's fine, though. I can fix that. Russell allowed me to put just my name on the deed. Those were more fees that I had to pay. Is his name on the mortgage? It is, and I suppose he's been getting the late notices too, but he's paying for a house with Robin, and I suppose he's just been ignoring them. Does he have visitation with the kids? Every other weekend. Nothing during the week? She shook her head. He tried to think what else truly mattered. He could ask about dates to move in and days to get married, but she seemed nervous and scared. If we're going to do this, I don't want to drag it out. She lifted her eyes, her expression resolute. He supposed a hasty marriage was never a good idea, but it wasn't like they were trying to figure out if they loved each other. They already knew they were friends. They also already knew both of them had character and integrity, and if they made vows, they would keep them. I'm fine with that, as long as you're okay. I don't want you to be married to me for a few years until you get over Russell and then decide that you've met your soulmate in someone else. I don't believe in soulmates. I believe in making the best with whoever you're with. I'm not looking around. If you're married, your eyes stay on your spouse. Then you don't know what you're missing. He nodded. He couldn't have said it better. Chapter 8 Find what makes your spouse feel loved. Then love him or her that way even when you don't feel like it. Terry Ware so I guess we ought to figure out logistics. You know, where we're going to live and how it's going to look. Katie clasped her hands together tightly in her lap and tried to project an aura of calm. Where would he sleep? Was he going to live with them? Did she want that? It wasn't really about what she wanted. She knew that. So much of life seemed to be based on doing what she wanted when it should be based on doing what was right. I know all of those things are important. Flynn shifted on the other side of the couch. She found it humorous that they were talking about getting married and yet there they were sitting on opposite ends of the furniture, 
more like a couple who had had a fight than one that was about to get married. What? Flynn searched her face, seeming to wonder why she was smiling. Nothing, really. I was just thinking how silly we look. Here on the couch, our positions are saying couple who's fighting, not couple who's getting married. He grunted, his lips curving just a little. I guess that's what I was about to say. I think logistics are important, and I guess you know that normally I would be all about that. But while I do believe that we shouldn't live by our emotions or our feelings, I also think they are important. I, I guess I have the kind of personality that wants to act like they're not. But I want you to be happy, and I think women enjoy romance and all the things that go with it. Her mouth dropped a little. She was not expecting that. She wasn't even sure she wanted it. While her divorce had just been finalized, she'd been separated from her husband for a year, and while there might be some lingering pain from the dreams that had been shattered, she didn't feel any pain from the destruction of their relationship. No lingering feelings toward him. But she still wasn't sure she was ready to do romance. Still, she couldn't argue with what was most assuredly a very accurate statement. Women do love romance. They love to be romanced. That's what I thought. So, I don't want to just focus on the things that are important to me. Logistics, how things are going to look, when we'll have the kids, when he'll have the kids, and how we'll be raising them together, the finances, and our work lives. All of those things. I think we need to discuss them. But I also think we ought to learn about each other. He paused, as though it was easy for him to talk about how co-parenting would look and how they needed to split the finances, but it was harder for him to get personal. I guess I want to know about you. Your favorite color, for instance. What you like to do in your spare time. All those little things that people talk about to get to know each other. He had charmed her, and he didn't even realize it. She knew he wasn't that kind of man, but that he was doing it just because he knew that was something that she needed, needed to feel that human connection, needed to feel like she was valued. And one way of doing that was by him showing interest in her. It meant more than she could say, and she looked at her hands while she tried to find words. It's okay if you're still stuck on your husband and you don't really want to have that kind of relationship with me. His words were a little more faint, and if she listened closely, she could hear a tone of hurt in them. She jerked her head up. No! She didn't want him to think for one moment that anything that he had just said was true. I don't have feelings for my ex. Russell is a jerk, and, well, sometimes our feelings are inexplicable, and we fall in love with the people we shouldn't, but I am so over him. It wouldn't matter if he were here on his knees in front of me begging me to go back to him. The divorce is final, and that road is closed. I'm not interested in going back down it. Not now, not ever. Good to know, Flynn said with a nod. She hadn't even thought that he might need to be reassured on that matter. You know, if there's anything you want to know, it's okay to ask. His eyes slid up to hers, and she realized again that talking about facts was easy for him, but talking about feelings was a struggle. She had to acknowledge it. Thank you for trying to do some hard things for me. I know this isn't a conversation that makes you comfortable. <laughs> no, not at all. But my comfort is not paramount. Our relationship is. If I have to sacrifice some comfort in order to make us stronger, you and me, then I will. What a great example. What a difference from Russell. What a standard for her to hold herself to. I'm not sure I'm that unselfish. 
I want to be, but... You've been hurt. I think it's natural when we have some kind of pain in our lives that we want to draw into ourselves, to nurse it until we're strong again. Yeah. <laughs> For not being an emotional person, you hit that right on the head. Even though our natural inclination is to draw in, if we open up, we can end up better off than we were to begin with. He gave his self-deprecating smile. I'm talking to myself. I know I can trust you. I just... I'm not comfortable. She swallowed, her throat feeling tight. Flynn was obviously trying hard to give more than his share. Sometimes giving didn't mean material things. It meant doing and saying things that were hard, the things that one knew would benefit someone else. That's part of what has always made you a good friend. You're willing to do a lot for the people you care about. Flynn didn't say anything, and she figured that was because the words were true, and he felt like she did, unable to figure out what to say in response. I agree with you, by the way, although I'm sure you probably already knew that. She gave him a reassuring smile and tried to shed some of the heaviness that had landed between them. And I'm the same, although I remember from high school that your favorite color is blue. I suppose it could have changed, but knowing you the way I do, it was probably blue when you were born, and it will be blue when you die. He smiled, and she was grateful he got her attempt at levity and allowed it. You do know me. But that's not to say that you're not allowed to change. She made sure to add that, because she didn't want him feeling pigeonholed. People could, and often did, change. I'll never change that. Blue's the best color in the world. That's why God made the sky blue, so there'd be so much of the perfect color. Now you think you know God's motivations while he designed the sky. She lifted her brows at him maybe flirting a little, although there certainly wasn't anything suggestive about what she was saying. But her words, or maybe it was the flirt in the arch of her brows, elicited a smile from him. A small one, but it was a victory. I'm just giving voice to what the rest of the world knows. She laughed. God's favorite color is green. That's a fact. I think fact-checkers would find that false. Absolutely not. After all, every leaf in the jungle is green, and there are a lot of them. Plus, every blade of grass is green. And you have to admit, there's probably more surface area of grass in the world than anything else. So, obviously, God loves green. I think we're having our first argument. Should we write this down so we can celebrate? If this is an argument, I don't mind arguing with you at all. <laughs> I've done more laughing, and I'm not the slightest bit upset. Unlike when Russell would argue with her. Although she tried to do whatever he wanted so they didn't fight. But it usually ended up with her doing all the giving, and him doing all the taking. If this argument was any indication... Flynn was determined to do as much giving as she did, and she had to say it was a welcome change. Welcome and refreshing. Is it terrible if I tell you that this small argument has actually eased my mind? Eased your mind about what? God's favorite color? She giggled. <laughs> no, about you and me. If we can argue, and you can give, and I can give, and we can laugh while we're doing it. I'm not afraid to disagree with you. I'm not afraid to move ahead with you, because I know you're not going to try to force your way or make sure you get what you deserve. Rather, you'll be looking out for me. And if I can get my selfish self to do the same thing and look out for you, we'll both end up winning. And what God said about marriage being a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church might actually be true. All of my family have solid marriages, but only a couple of them really make me feel like they display the relationship of Christ and the church. 
And yeah, you're absolutely right. That's the kind of give and take it takes. I think that's why marriage lasts so long. You have your entire lifetime to work on getting it right. But it takes two. No matter how hard I worked on my marriage with Russell, it was never going to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church because I was the one doing all the giving. And he snuck behind her back, breaking the covenant and lying and cheating on her. The thought still gave her a twinge of pain. Not because of any tender feeling she had toward Russell, but because of the time she wasted and the dreams that were broken and could never be rebuilt. I guess that's why God gives us a clean day every day, fresh with no mistakes in it. She tilted her head. Have you watched Anne of Green Gables? It's possible when I was younger, I was forced to. That's just the line that stuck with me. There are a lot of great lines in that movie. I guess we're going to have our second argument. She laughed. Not if you stop being stubborn and just agree with me. You want me to lie? Anne of Green Gables is a great movie. So is Die Hard. Die Hard? Any movie with the word die in the title cannot possibly be a movie that anyone should be watching. It's a classic, one of Hollywood's greatest. Everyone should watch it. So it's an uplifting Christian movie with lots of spiritual truths in it? She looked at him from under her brows. Yeah, absolutely. There is loyalty and friendship and sacrificial love. You're struggling, and I feel like you're making this up. No, I wasn't making anything up. Do people die in this movie? Well, yeah, but people die in real life, too. Like they die in the movie? In some areas. You're losing this argument, just so you know that. I would have lost the argument, but you're going to let me win just because you're practicing giving in. She stared at him for a moment, and then, just because she figured that it wouldn't hurt anything at all, she said, You know what? You're right. I bet Hard Die is one of the greatest movies ever made and Die Hard. What? The name of the movie. Did I get it wrong? Yeah, it's Die Hard. If you're going to let me win the argument and capitulate, you need to do it correctly. She laughed because it was exactly what she would have thought with his personality, that she had to get the details right. All right, Die Hard. Best movie ever. And for our first date, that's the movie we're going to watch. She lifted her brows and he gave her a little nod. Because, after all, how can you be married to someone who is so sadly lacking in social graces that she hasn't seen the best movie Hollywood ever put out? That's more like it. A very gracious loser. I like it. They laughed together, and she found herself feeling at ease and maybe even feeling a bit of an affinity, possibly attraction, toward him. It could be attraction, but at least he felt like someone she could laugh with and hopefully build a future with. They talked a bit about the logistics, that he would be moving to her house, that there was a spare bedroom in the basement. She even offered to move down to it, but he shook his head and said he'd take it, and they talked about a time frame for him moving upstairs, but he was willing to give her time. The thought made her a little nervous, but she also felt resigned. It was like he had said. She couldn't have everything she wanted without giving some things. Because both of them needed to be happy. It wasn't right to make him stay in the basement indefinitely. Russell is supposed to have the kids every other weekend, but it usually ends up being once a month, because he almost always cancels at least once. Jerk. She appreciated his one-word assessment, but she shrugged. I would prefer the kids not be with him at all. After all, if he thinks it's okay to make vows and then break them, I don't really want him to be any kind of influence in their lives. How do the kids feel about it? 
She appreciated that he cared. It was also unexpected. Flynn was not exactly a touchy-feely, caring kind of man. Obviously, he was making an effort. That effort meant more to her than anything else he had done. The younger two are fine with it. I don't think they really care. At least, they haven't really acted like it. Of course, they were hurt when he left and cried, but both of them seem to be resigned, and most of the time, they would rather be with me anyway. But Debbie? Her eyes widened. She hadn't expected him to know the names of her children. She wanted to ask how he knew them, whether he had known them from before, from church, or whether he had purposely learned them since they'd been in the basement with the peacemakers. That would actually be a little bit amazing to her, since he thought she had rejected him. Rather than asking, though, she said, Debbie has struggled. She blames me for everything. She wants me to beg her dad to come back. And honestly, I have. She wasn't proud of that, but she hadn't wanted her family to be blown up the way it had. She would have been willing to forgive his infidelity if he would just come back and try to piece her family back together, giving their children a stable two-parent home, giving her the marriage that she'd worked hard for back. I guess I would have too. He didn't say anything more but seemed thoughtful, and she got the feeling that even though they were different, he understood. Understood she wanted her marriage, her family, her dream of defying the odds and truly meaning until death do them part. Anyway, she throws a fit any time her dad can't make it. Usually I bear the brunt of it, but a couple of times she's unloaded on him. He just walks away. Sometimes she wished that she was able to do that just walk away from her problems and not have to worry about them anymore. How nice it must be to have no conscience and be able to turn one's back on everyone who loved him and cared about him and whom he had promised to love and care for, and just do what he wanted with no guilt. Most of the time, she didn't think like that. Most of the time, her heart broke into tiny little pieces over the pain of her children. Debbie, in particular. Debbie, who had never given them a second of trouble, who had been an overachiever, always wanting to please her parents and do whatever it was they wanted her to. She had gotten straight A's in school and had a heart to help others. She had been emotionally devastated by the divorce. Have they been in counseling? Some. It's not something I've been able to afford much of and we all dropped out after about six months. The counseling sessions had been focused on her and what she wanted and healing, and the counselor had left God out of the picture almost entirely. It wasn't the way she thought healing should happen, and she found herself searching her Bible for answers far more than she considered what her counselor had said. Chapter 9 being a complement to each other's personalities has always been important in our marriage. When one is more organized and the other is laid back, it helps provide balance in the relationship. The more high-spirited one gets things accomplished timely, while the calmer person brings lightness and fun. Cindy Rosinski Have you told the kids what you're thinking about? Flynn didn't say the word marriage but Katie assumed that's what he meant. No, I haven't mentioned it to them at all. I... I don't know what to say. I don't want them to meet someone one day and get married the next, but at the same time, I want them to do what God wants them to do, even if it seems outrageously crazy to the rest of the world. Like building an ark when it has never rained before. Yeah just like that. When I was standing in the church with the peacemakers before you came in, they asked me if I would be willing to marry you. Mav said yes right away, just willing to take on a new challenge, just like that, I guess. 
but I didn't want to say yes until I knew for sure I could totally commit and stand behind my word. I'd actually been thinking about it and praying about it, even though you'd said that you'd prefer Mav. I'm sorry. He shook his head. It doesn't matter. It does. I would be hurt if you had a choice between two people and you chose someone else, then you came back to me when that person wasn't what you thought. Particularly if you knew I was the better choice to begin with, but you just went with what was new or exciting or what you thought would be more fun. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm serious. It doesn't matter. Because the peacemakers asking me that made me think. Think about marriage, about relationships, and how, at their core, they're about commitment. Finding someone who is honest and has integrity and will do what they say they're going to do, even if it hurts them. Even if it's not the best thing for them. Even if it's hard and they want to quit. But they have perseverance and dedication and a strong sense of wanting to do what's right. Someone like that, someone you can take a chance on, without having to date them for years to find out what they're really like. She honestly was kind of stunned. He really had been thinking about it. He really had been considering the idea. And even though she clearly said she didn't want him, he'd been looking at it through the lens of what a Christian would do, and not through the lens of his hurt feelings or what he deserved or making sure he hurt her as much as she hurt him. I wish I was that mature in my thinking. I think my divorce wouldn't have been nearly as hard, and I wouldn't have struggled for as long as I have, holding resentments and unforgiveness. Divorce is hard. Everyone knows that. Maybe it's because God has joined two people and they become one. So someone walking out on you is like losing a part of yourself. You heal, but there will always be scars. Always. You live with that for the rest of your life. That's discouraging. It's why divorce should be the absolute last option for anyone. Because not only will you have the scars, your kids will have them too. I guess, in some ways, children are resilient, and they just form and grow and sometimes don't notice the scars because they're a part of them, but they're there. Katie knew that to be true, and honestly, while her divorce had been devastating for her, she had heard it was 100 times worse for her kids. All the good things she wanted for them, all the hopes and dreams she had were wrapped up in doing the very best that she could for her children. She would never have brought them into the world if she had known her husband wouldn't be there to help her raise them. I'm sorry, that's not really helping you. I guess that's something that's been kind of rolling over in my head, something I thought about today, even though I thought you would be with someone else. How your family has been devastated, and how anyone who steps in will need to be, maybe not sensitive to that fact, but cognizant. Also, the idea that God raises beauty from ashes. That people who have already been through trauma don't deserve to go through it again, and I don't want to have any part of that. So, the idea of committing is even greater, to me, anyway. And the idea of starting fresh, of God forgiving the past, and us letting go of it, and embarking on something new, building something beautiful, Allowing God to work and use us to grow into something great, something even better than what you had imagined to begin with in your first marriage. That's just what I've been thinking. His voice kind of trailed off at the end, like he wasn't sure what she would think about him mashing their lives together already. That's beautiful and encouraging. The idea that God is a God of second chances of taking something that seems worthless, broken and trashed, and making something beautiful out of it, using it for his glory in a way that the human mind could never imagine. He nodded. I think that's probably key. Sometimes we just can't see, when we're sitting amidst the rubble of our lives, kind of like Job did, how God could take that 
and do anything good with it. How the sorrow and the hurt will transform us into stronger, more empathetic and compassionate Christians. How our lives will change and become something we never dreamed of. God does that. Listening to you is better than going to a motivational speaker. She looked at him sideways because she could feel how his words were working in her heart, swirling through the ashes there, touching the tender places. The spot she never thought would come to life again seemed to shimmer and send out tender roots. And for the first time since Russell had walked out, she could picture her life being more than just drudgery, frustration, and simply putting in her time until God called her home. Maybe there will be joy and laughter and fun again. She paused for just a moment. Romance. She couldn't lift her eyes and look at him, couldn't admit how disposable she felt, how rotten and ugly, worthless, and how she longed, had always longed, to have someone who saw all of her faults and loved her just as she was, even while he inspired her to be better. You seem a little too good to be true. I think I might be tired. I bet you are. We've been sitting here talking for several hours, and you had a long day. You did too. That's true. His words were dismissive, though, like his hard day wasn't anything compared to hers. It's like he gave a nod to the fact that she was dealing with a lot of emotional baggage as well as children and family, on top of her job. Completely different from Russell, who was always dismissive of anything that she did and always placed a lot of importance on whatever it was that he had going on. She didn't want to compare the two, but it was almost impossible to not have Russell's selfishness highlighted in the face of Flynn's complete and total selflessness. I guess I better go. She stood, then stopped short. We never decided on a date. She looked at him as he rose to stand beside her, and gradually one corner of his mouth lifted up. You're right. What do you think? I work all weekend, but I have Monday off. Monday will work for you then? It does. It's good for me too. That's usually a slow day at the shop although my work does not always follow the rhythm of the trucks. She wasn't sure exactly what he meant by that, but she figured she'd find out eventually. And like he'd said, as long as she knew she was with a person of character, who was willing to change and grow and become better, wasn't stuck on his way, but was willing to give up what he wanted for the people around him, then whatever obstacles they found themselves facing, they could work through them. Well, that kind of makes it real. It does. Exciting, too. <laughs> you look anything but excited. I guess I just don't show it. But it's there. He shrugged. Would you like for me to talk to the pastor? Yeah, would you mind doing that? And I'll talk to the peacemakers. I guess I'll also have to call Mav and let him know that I've changed my mind about him. Are you sure about that? He let out a breath. I don't want you making a decision that you think you will regret later. I probably will never be spontaneous and exciting the way he is. I think he's a good man, but I know I've made the right choice. You and I were really good friends once, and I know you're perfect for me and for my children. Do you need me to be with you when you tell them? She followed his change of subject from Mav to the children. No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to explain to them that it's not something I want them to do. I've always tried to model the behavior I want my children to emulate. I've never said to them, I'm going to do this, but I don't ever want you to. I think that's the best way to raise children. More is caught than taught. Yeah, that's been true for me in my life. I don't pay attention to people's words if they don't match up with their actions. Hard for me to do that, too. 
I definitely have more of a tendency to watch what someone does than listen to them spout off their opinion or even their words of praise. She closed her eyes and shook her head. Funny you should mention that. Russell was always telling me how I was so good at cooking, yet he never wanted to eat with us. He always said I was great with animals, but he never wanted to have any. And he told me that I was important to him, the most important thing, and yet he didn't make time for us. She could go on and on, the things he'd said that his actions had shown to be lies all of them. Flynn was quiet for a moment, as though thinking about what she had said. Then, to her surprise, he asked, You like animals? I always have. Cows are my favorite. Cows? He spit the word out like he could hardly believe it. I've always wanted a Highlander, just thought they were cute. His brows knitted together for a minute, and he tilted his head. They're like the furry things, with big horns? Yeah, and they're just adorable. You can get miniature ones. We have ten acres in the back of our house. A miniature Highlander would easily fit in our pasture. Although cows are herd animals, so we probably should get two. She didn't know what she was saying. There was no way she had time for a cow. She definitely didn't have the money. A miniature cow wouldn't be nearly as expensive to keep as a regular-sized one. It would probably cost as much as a dog. So, you never considered getting a normal house pet? Like a cat? Russell was allergic. Oh, that's too bad. He didn't say anything more, and she didn't press the issue. She'd love to have animals. Dogs, cats, a cow but she had plants instead, and she supposed that was just as well since she couldn't seem to keep them alive. It would be much worse to have the same kind of trouble with an animal. They said a few more words, making plans for him to move some of his things in after she talked to her children about what was happening, and solidifying their plans for Monday, exchanging phone numbers, with him promising to let her know what the pastor said, and her promising to let him know if she ran into any unexpected snags with the kids. She wasn't going to ask her children's permission. They weren't old enough to give that. If they were teenagers, she might consider it a little more. As it was, Debbie was only ten. Debbie. She would be the one to get in trouble. But after talking with Flynn tonight, Katie was sure in the long run she was doing the absolute very best thing for Debbie, even if she didn't appreciate it right now. Chapter 10 Be patient and put yourself in your spouse's shoes, not because you have it all figured out in your head. Be respectful to your spouse's feelings and ideas, no matter if you don't agree. Marilou Wright, Meridian, Idaho. Flynn pulled into Tygo Riley's drive. His place was forty minutes outside of Sweetwater, with no other houses in sight. Tyg lived with his niece in the caretaker's cottage adjacent to the large mansion that Ford Hansen lived in with his wife. Ford, a billionaire businessman, had been breeding Highlander cattle for at least five years. He also dabbled in providing a home for retired racehorses. From what Flynn had heard around Sweetwater, Tyg had come from Ireland as the groom to a racehorse that he'd fallen in love with and hadn't been able to part from. So, when the horse had been sold to an American, he packed his bags, offered his services to the wealthy owner who had purchased the horse, and moved across the ocean. Regardless of whether or not that was true, Tyg was the man who took care of the animals on Ford's farm. He was also the man Flynn needed to talk to to buy a wedding present for his wife-to-be. The fields were greening up, and Tyg's cottage came into sight as Flynn drove slowly down the drive. Flowers grew along the base of the white cottage, yellow and red and pink, giving life and color and lending a sense of coziness to the place. As far as Flynn knew, Tyg was not married. 
but Flynn didn't exactly run in Tige's circles. Even though he knew of him and had spoken to him a few times at church, he didn't really know him. His brother Nolt had given Flynn Tige's name. He had shod some horses for him, and when Flynn had asked his brothers at the shop this morning where he could find a Highlander cow, Nolt had reminded him that Ford bred them, and Tige took care of them. Pulling to a stop in front of the house, he looked around at the white fences and small shed. The field, lush and green, had a half a dozen or so small, shaggy cattle in it. Those must be the Highlanders. Further back, Flynn saw several horses, which he assumed must be the retired racehorses. They looked sleek and muscular, but they grazed placidly, like they had not a care in the world. Good afternoon to you, Tig said as he came around the shed and walked toward where Flynn stood beside his car. Afternoon. Thanks for meeting me on such short notice. Not a problem. We're on country time here, which means we have time for neighbors. Tig's green eyes glinted, contrasting with his dark hair. His easy smile was friendly and confident. The best time to be on, Flynn said easily, grasping Tig's proffered hand and shaking it firmly. A little girl skipped across the parking area before Flynn could say anything more. She ran into Tig's side, wrapping her arms around the man. Flynn didn't know much about kids, although he knew he was going to be learning, but the little girl looked to be around ten or eleven in his estimation. This is my niece, Ellen. I'm her guardian, and she's sad that we're selling one of the wee ones. I know that's what we do, but I bottle-fed two of them, and I'm afraid you're going to take them. Now, Ellen, we talked about this. It might be a good thing for Mr. Flynn to take them, since they won't be very far from you, and he might let you visit. I'm looking for two, and bottle-fed sounds good to me. Are they boys or girls? Flynn asked, hoping he didn't sound too unknowing. He was an accountant and a part-time mechanic. He knew nothing about cows, other than Katie loved them, and he... Maybe he didn't love Katie, but he wanted to do something kind for her. She spent a lot of time serving others and never doing anything for herself. He knew God would take care of her, but sometimes God used people to take care of people. And in this case, Flynn was pretty sure God was using him to take care of Katie. That was the way it should be between a husband and wife anyway. Plus, when he cared about someone, he liked to see them smile. Maybe that was what he wanted, just to see Katie smile. Or maybe he wanted a little more. Maybe he wanted to show her that he was serious about her, that he listened that his goal was to be the kind of man who actually heard what she said and acted on it, and not the kind of man who just let whatever his wife was saying go in one ear and out the other. He knew a lot of husbands like that, and he didn't want that to be him. It wasn't something that came natural to him, though, and this was just the first step in what he hoped would be a lifetime of steps, working to become someone who was considerate and kind and thoughtful. Two heifers, a heifers or lasses, Tig said with another twinkle in his eye. Sisters? Flynn asked, again not sure if he was sounding stupid or not. Tig had started walking, motioning for him to follow, and they fell into step together with Ellen walking on Tig's other side, his arm around her shoulders. The rumors that Flynn had heard about Tig living with his daughter had not been quite right. Part of him wondered what he was doing so far from his home country with his niece, and another part of him figured that it wasn't any of his business. The girl looked well taken care of, and she obviously adored Tig. Maybe she was the one responsible for the flowers, since Tig didn't strike him as a flower-growing type. But Flynn's forte was not in figuring people out. He was much better with numbers. Numbers were so much easier than people. They were what they were, and they followed rules when they changed. Twins. Sometimes when a cow has twins, she'll reject one. Their mama rejected both of them, so we ended up bottle-feeding the young ones. I did most of it, 
Ellen piped up from the other side of Tyke. In the morning before I went to school, and in the evening after I got home. Sometimes Uncle Ty gave them a bottle in the middle of the day, and when they were really young, we gave them another bottle at night before we went to bed. Flynn nodded solemnly at the little girl, smiling on the inside. She was precocious, chatty, and friendly. He wondered if Katie's children would be anything like her. Not that it mattered. Whatever they were, he would be happy with them, learn to love them, and assume they were what God wanted him to have. But there was something friendly and sweet about Ellen that just made him want to smile. Are you looking to start raising them? Tig asked conversationally. I wanted to buy them for Katie. She and I are getting married on Monday. They're wedding presents. Tig tripped, stumbled, and straightened before stopping, looking at Flynn like he was nuts in the head. Maybe he was. Yeah, she loves Highlanders and has never been able to have any. But she has a big pasture behind her house, and I figured they'd make a good gift. If you've never had cattle before, I definitely think it might be a good idea for you to have Ellen over a few times to let you know what to do and to show you how to care for them. Tig's eyes were twinkling again, and he winked at Flynn before glancing down at his niece. Flynn nodded solemnly. I definitely think we need someone to give us a hand, show us the ropes, so to speak. I'd probably have to pay them. He looked directly at Ellen. Are you for hire? You mean you'd pay me to come out and talk to you about my calves? She asked, sounding extremely shocked but also excited. That seems only fair. If you have to take time out of your schedule to come to my house and show me how to take care of my cows. Can I, Uncle Tyke? She looked up into Tyke's face, eagerness and pleading on her own. You sure can, lassie, Tyg said, ruffling her hair. He turned back to Flynn. These wee ones are six months old, and they're both healthy and up-to-date on their vaccinations. I do have a bull that is not related to them. If you're interested in breeding them, we can talk about that. How old do they have to be? Flynn appreciated that Tyg had not made him feel like an idiot for not knowing anything about cattle. It's a good rule of thumb to say 12 months, but it wouldn't hurt to wait a couple more. It's also nice to have calves early in the spring or fall, to avoid the extremes and temperatures of winter and summer. Although, Highlanders have nice warm coats, and they do well in the cold. They'd have to, if they're going to make it here in North Dakota. Just like all of us, I... Flynn left that alone, as they came to the small pasture where a dozen or so calves grazed calmly. Several of them raised their heads as they heard the voices. A few of them didn't pay any attention at all, and a couple walked over to the fence. You can tell these two are bottle-fed. They're coming over to see if we brought them anything to eat. They're pretty. Flynn would never have thought that he would call a cow pretty, but one was white with dark roots along her hair and dark around her eyes, and the other was a golden cream color. These are the prettiest ones we have, Ellen added, just in case he was wondering what her opinion was. He supposed he could have guessed she would say that. All of these in this pasture are for sale if you see something you'd like better, although five of them are steers, boys. So if you're looking for girls, I can point the other heifers out to you. Tyke paused. But if you're looking for family pets, these two would be your best bet. The other ones were raised by their mums, and while they're not wild, they're not the big babies that these lasses are. They're not babies. They're sweet, Helen said, reaching through the fence and scratching both calves at once. They stretched their necks out and seemed to be in blissful heaven as the young girl ran her fingers up and down over the bottoms of their necks. I meant babies in a good way, Tyke said easily, sharing a smile with his young charge. He turned toward Flynn. Would you like to see the mums? Sure, Flynn said, although he was sure he was taking the two that Ellen was petting. I'm going to stay here. Even though I'm going to be able to visit them, I want to spend time with them while I can. That's fine, lassie, Tig said easily. He nodded at Flynn, and they walked off along the fence. She seems pretty attached to those girls. Are you sure it's okay to part with them? She'll have to eventually anyway, 
But I, it's a little heartbreaking. She needs siblings. Seems like you might be in charge of whether or not she gets them. Tig chuckled a little at that. I guess it's more God than me. I'm willing. Just God needs to bring the last to me, since I can't really leave the farm to go find her. There is a whole world of dating online. And you have experience in that. Tig lifted a brow as he opened the gate and waited for Flynn to walk through. Well, no. But I'm not so sure it's biblical for a man to just sit around and wait for a woman. After all, you don't really see that in the Bible. It'd be grand if the good Lord had given us more clear directions. But I suppose you're right. When Isaac needed a wife, his da sent a bunch of people to go find one for him. He didn't just sit around waiting for her to show up. Same with Jacob. He saw her, then he worked for her. I guess King Ahasuerus gave a command to have women brought to him, but at least he had to give the command. That he did. I suppose it's kind of like everything else. God helps those who help themselves. We need to pray as hard as we can, then work as hard as we can. I'm not a good example of that, though. He shrugged as his eyes landed on a small herd of shaggy-looking cattle. Oi, me either. So I've just been praying about it, and I suppose it's wrong for me to hope that God will just drop her in my lap when I've never expected him to drop anything else into my lap. But for Ellen's sake, it'd be nice if he would. Flynn figured he could add that to his prayer list. Tig didn't even need to know. But if the guy wanted a woman dropped in his lap, it wouldn't hurt to pray about it. He didn't know how God would manage to do that. Flynn chuckled a little to himself. Actually, it might be fun to see how God answered that prayer. They looked at the moms. Tig gave him some tips on taking care of the calves and he arranged with Tig to deliver the calves Monday evening. They were planning on getting married while the kids were at school. Monday evening, they'd have a nice supper, and then hopefully the calves would show up. While Flynn knew things usually didn't go as planned, he was hoping, this time at least, they would. He wanted Katie to have, if not the fairy tale princess wedding of every girl's dream, at least a day she could look back on with a smile something that would warm her heart, something that made her know that her husband cared about her and truly wanted her to smile, to do things that would make her smile, that he wasn't a jerk who only thought of himself, and that he wasn't the kind of man who was incapable of being thoughtful or considerate. That was his hope, anyway. As they started back toward the calves, Tig said, You know, I never really thought about it. But cows are a grand gift, if that's what she wants. Often we're tied up in candy and flowers and we can't get our mind on anything else. But it's so much better to give a gift that suits a person's interests. So many times I don't know what a person's interests are. Or if I do know, I don't know what they have or what they would want that would relate to it. But in this case, she flat out told me she wanted cows and her husband wouldn't let her have them. It's hard to miss a hint like that. The funny thing is, she wasn't hinting. She was just telling me. And normally that's a comment I probably wouldn't even have remembered. But somehow I was thinking about making her smile, making her happy, and it just struck me. Well, it'll last a lot longer than cut flowers. Speaking of, she mentioned she liked plants, but she always kills them. I was thinking about getting a tree, too. Do you think that's terrible? Normally, Flynn would not have asked another man's advice on what gift to get his wife to be, but he was feeling a little insecure. He'd already committed to the calves, which were very much out-of-the-box gifts. A tree, that might be even crazier, especially if she set a lot of store by it and it ended up dying. He wouldn't want that to become symbolism for their marriage that the tree he got for their wedding died, so their marriage was doomed. He didn't think Katie would be like that. You know, funny you should mention it, but I have small indoor trees in my greenhouse. You want to take a gander? I'll let you pick whatever you want. Flynn agreed, and they changed direction, 
walking toward the house rather than back toward the calves. By the time Flynn left Tig's small property, he was a lot poorer, and he was also the owner of a small ponytail tree and two Highlander calves. He had no idea whether Katie would like the tree or not, but at least he could say he had listened to her and tried his best. He supposed that's all he could do. Chapter 11 Love, of course, trust and determination to make it forever. Sue Prophet from Oregon Flynn loves ham, Sadie said with a confidence that carried clearly through the phone to Katie's ear. That's easy. It is, although he would love something called brown sugar pineapple crockpot ham the best. I've never heard of it. It's a recipe I found years ago, and all of my brothers absolutely adored. I can text it to you if that works. I'd really appreciate it. I want our first meal to be special for him. I know that we're not going to do what people traditionally do for their weddings, but I just want him to know that I'm thinking about him in care. I appreciate that. Flynn is quiet. A lot of people overlook him. People might call him boring, but there's a deepness there and a sensitivity that people don't notice. He'll work his heart out for you, but he'll probably do it without ever even saying anything, and it'll be up to you to notice. I think you're perfect for him, because I'm pretty sure you're not going to let him get away with doing things for you without paying attention and giving him appreciation and credit. Thank you. That meant a lot to Katie coming from Flynn's sister. I'm going to try my best. I appreciate your help. What do you usually serve with this ham? I think scalloped potatoes would go really well with it, but my brothers all love mashed potatoes. They're Flynn's favorite as well. In fact, I think mashed potatoes might be his absolute favorite food of all time. That's helpful. Katie drew up a notes app on her phone and typed that info in. She thought she could probably remember his favorite things, but she wanted to make sure she did. Notes were always the best idea. Anything else? She asked. This is going to sound crazy, but Flynn loves beets. Ham and beets, that is different. I'm pretty sure he would really appreciate it. I could be wrong but because you're right. Beets really don't go with ham, and especially this ham, because it has pineapple and brown sugar in it. But those would be Flynn's three favorite foods. And he doesn't like chocolate, so if you're going to do a dessert, I suggest something that doesn't have chocolate in it. Got it. Thank you. They chatted for a few more minutes before they hung up. Katie had told Sadie about the wedding, which Sadie had already heard from Flynn and her other brothers, since their family all worked at the garage together and had talked about it. Katie figured it was probably all over town, but she gave Sadie all the details that she knew, and she appreciated Sadie returning the favor by letting her know what Flynn particularly liked to eat. She didn't know what else she could do for him, other than insisting he didn't have to move to the basement. She could do that, but she didn't know what to suggest they do instead, and she wasn't sure how to broach that subject anyway. Her phone rang, and she glanced at the number, seeing that it was her mom before she swiped. Taking a deep breath, she said, Hello? Katie, you've been trying to get a hold of me? All weekend. We just seem to be missing each other. She'd been trying to call her mom since Saturday night when she and Flynn had talked. Here it was Monday morning, and her mom was just now getting back to her. She felt a little bad that the whole town of Sweetwater probably knew more about her private life than her mom did, but there was nothing she could do about it. I'm sorry. It was the spring festival after church yesterday, and I've been spending a lot of time getting ready for and running it. You know how that goes. I know, Mom. That's a crazy day. But the church makes a lot of money, and they always give it to a really great cause. They do. 
They're supporting foster families with it this year. I was really excited about it. Anytime children are benefited, you know it just pulls on every heartstring I have. I know, Mom. Her mom had 17 grandchildren from her five kids, and she loved every single one of them and always had room in her heart for more, whether they were from her own children or not. She probably would have been over the moon if Katie had moved back in with her, but it felt like failure to move back in with her parents as much as her mom would like it. Maybe if she were choosing to move back in just because her mom needed help, that would be one thing. But to move back in because her husband had left her and she couldn't pay her mortgage was a completely different story. So what did you want, Katie? I feel bad that I wasn't around when you needed me. Hopefully it's nothing serious. I'm getting married. That's serious. She could hear the humor in her mom's voice. Her mom was not a drama queen, and raising five kids had made her learn how to roll with the punches. I didn't know you were seeing anyone, but it's nice that I know about the wedding. I assume I'm invited, and I assume it will be a Christmas wedding? It's this afternoon, and I guess we're not really inviting anyone. I'm sorry. I thought you said this afternoon. I'm sure I must have misheard you. No, that's exactly what I said. Henry, your daughter's doing something crazy. I think you might need to come and talk her out of it. Mom. Katie, you have done some nutty things in your life. Marrying Russell was at the top of that list. Her mom had a bit of warning in her voice. Katie cringed. Her mother had not wanted her to marry Russell. Before her mom could get up a good head of steam to continue telling her every stupid thing she'd ever done, Katie said, You were right about Russell, Mom. I've told you that over and over. And you're not going to give me a chance to meet this fellow? Maybe he's not right for you either. Actually, you've known each other less than a year, I assume. The last time I talked to you, you didn't mention anything about a boyfriend or any man at all. Should I assume this is some kind of whirlwind romance? Well, actually, Mom, it's more like a marriage of convenience. Marriage and convenience are words that do not belong in the same sentence together. I'm not even sure they belong in the same century together. But I am sure that they don't belong in this century. I know, Mom. I think you might be right about that. Except... I know that the man I'm marrying is a godly man, one who has character and integrity. I think you'll agree with me, even if you haven't thought about it before. That's what a marriage should be built on. Two people who share the same values and morals, who have character and integrity, who do what they say they're going to do, and who keep their word. Those people deciding that they want to spend their lives together. Her mom was quiet for a bit. Katie figured she'd probably taken the wind out of her sails. Her mom loved her, and while her opinions could be quite strong, she also was reasonable and wasn't afraid to change her mind if evidence was presented that whatever she believed did not line up with the Bible. With that thought, Katie added, The Bible doesn't say that you have to date before you get married. It doesn't even say that you have to court. Look at Isaac and Rebecca. They got married as soon as they met. And they were comfortable doing that because Rebecca came from a family that Abraham trusted to have the same values and morals that they did. She didn't need to say anything more. Even though her mom hadn't said a word, the silence had somehow changed. I can't argue with anything that you're saying, her mom finally said sounding much more subdued and almost sad compared to the way she'd sounded before. It's kind of humbling when you hear your kid talk and she sounds wiser than you. Mom, I'm not wiser than you. I'm just wiser than I used to be. Much wiser than I was when I married Russell. I'd like to see this man who has character and integrity and shares your values and morals. 
Maybe we could drive up next weekend. The kids are supposed to be spending that weekend with Russell, but at least you'd meet Flynn. Oh, his name is Flynn, Henry. <laughs> Sorry, Katie murmured, knowing that she probably should have told her mom the name of the man she was marrying earlier in the conversation. Katie, I just want you to know that there's this newfangled thing that you can do on your phone. It's called texting. When you have something big, you want to tell your parents something really huge. For example, if you're getting married, you could always, if you can't get a hold of them by phone, text them. I'm sorry, Mom. I guess I just thought that announcing my marriage might be something that I needed to talk to you about, especially since it was so unexpected and since I'm also doing it in an unexpected way. Unexpected. That's a good word. It seems to sum up pretty much the entirety of our conversation. Mom. I'm sorry, Katie. I am shocked. I'm also humbled by your wisdom, and I'm still trying to get on board with the whole idea, even though you make perfect sense to me and I can almost believe this might really work. I'd just like to meet this man and see how I feel about his character and integrity. But since I can't, I'm going to talk to God about it and ask him to take care of you, the way I usually do. Thanks, Mom. Do you need me to watch the kids? No. We, we were friends in high school. You might remember Flynn. We were in the band together and were just friends. We decided that we would get to know each other and kind of take the romance part of our relationship slowly. Her mom didn't say anything, possibly sorting back through the memory she'd had of the time they lived in Sweetwater. Katie's parents had moved to the cities to take care of her mom's parents shortly after Katie graduated and got married and settled down in town. Her mom's parents had passed away, but Katie's parents had stayed in the cities because, as her mom put it, moving was a pain. They chatted a bit more, with Katie's mom on board with the idea, asking a few more questions about Flynn and about the kids, making Katie promise to FaceTime if not after the wedding, sometime during the week, which Katie promised easily. They hung up, and a weight lifted off Katie's chest. If her parents had objected, if they hadn't wanted her to follow her logic and wanted her to wait, she would have. At least, she thought she would have. She didn't want to go into a marriage without her parents' approval. Thankfully, God had given her the words to make her mom see that marriage didn't have to be the way society dictated. Courtship, dating, it wasn't that there was something completely wrong with it, although Katie did have her doubts, but being rational about it, making a decision based on what she felt God wanted for her, rather than catering to her own wants and needs, seemed like such a much more intelligent way of choosing a mate. If only she had been that smart when she was younger. Unfortunately, it was too late to go back and change the past. But maybe she could use her mistake as a teaching opportunity for her children. Society might tell her that she was leading them in the wrong direction if she were to encourage them not to date but to listen to God. To not look for a man who was handsome or successful or all the things society told women they needed in a mate and instead look for character, integrity, someone who kept his word and loved his God, who acted out what he believed rather than just giving lip service on Sunday morning in a church service, if he went at all. Katie shoved her phone in her back pocket, grabbing her purse. She had all day off from the diner, and she planned on going grocery shopping, getting the things Sadie had mentioned, and bringing them back to the house before she went to the church. Flynn had texted her that the pastor had agreed to marry them, but he wanted them to show up an hour or so early so that he could give them a little marriage counseling. When she had talked to Charlene, Charlene had asked to talk to them before the wedding as well, because she had a schedule she wanted to give them. Charlene had called it a kissing schedule. In her head, Katie couldn't imagine that, 
but she was determined to take the advice of godly men and women because she was determined that this time her marriage truly would last for the rest of her life. Chapter 12 Being Too Stubborn to Quit Robin Diebold, Racine, Wisconsin It says in Genesis that God created a woman to be a help meet for a man. The pastor looked up from his Bible, his glasses on the end of his nose, his gaze taking in first Katie, then Flynn. Flynn didn't squirm. So far, the pastor had been personable, as he was every Sunday. He didn't seem to want to beat them over the head with the Bible, but his heart truly seemed to have a desire to help. The words help meet do not mean help mate, the way a lot of people think it does. It's actually two words, help and meet. Meet means fit or suitable. So, this verse is saying God didn't want man to be alone. He decided to make him a helper suitable for the man. The pastor lifted both hands. Now, I know in today's modern society, I will be called sexist, along with a bunch of other words, for suggesting that a woman was created to help her man. However, this is not a concept that I came up with to suppress women. It's a concept that's in the Bible. It defines the man-woman relationship from the very beginning. If people have a problem with it, they need to go to the Creator. He put his hands back down, stapling his fingers together over top of the Holy Scriptures open in front of him. I personally am not smart enough to give men and women my opinion on how to have a relationship. And I'll just be frank with you. Any man who tries to tell us how to do it, or woman for that matter, no matter how many degrees they have, is a created being telling you. If they disagree with this, he pointed down at the scriptures, then it's a matter of the created being thinking they know better than the creator how things ought to be done. He smiled gently. It would be like you building a car and having the car tell you that it doesn't want gas in its tank. It would prefer sugar. Maybe the pastor used that because he knew that Flynn came from a family of mechanics. But it made sense to him and wasn't a hard concept. Who was he to disagree with the Bible? So I'm just going to point out what the Bible says, and that is women were created to help their men. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Does that mean a woman can't have a career? Does it mean that she has to stay home and serve her man all day long? I don't think so. He answered his own question. But it does mean that a woman's primary purpose is to be company for, after all, she was created so he wouldn't be alone, and to support and encourage and uplift the man she's married to. He looked between them again. Then his eyes settled on Flynn. And just in case you're getting excited about this idea of having someone who was created to be the wind beneath your wings, if I can borrow popular song lyrics, which, I might add, are definitely biblical when it comes to a marriage relationship, you, as the man in the relationship, actually have a greater responsibility. He gave that a second to sink in before he continued. If you go down in Genesis, it says the man was to eat bread in the sweat of his face. That's another way to say he was to work in order to eat. In other words, the man was told he was to be the provider. He lifted his brows at Flynn. If your wife wants to work, and you two agree that that's okay, it's fine. But you should not depend on her salary in order to support your family. It should not be necessary to have a two-income home. The man should be shouldering responsibility for providing for the family. It's right here in black and white. Again, the pastor shrugged, almost apologetic, because everything he was saying 
just reading what was written clearly in the Bible, had been neglected by society and Christians alike. No one wanted to hear the truth. That wasn't true. Flynn wanted to hear it. He wanted to do it. He didn't have any illusions about whether his way was better or whether God's way was better. The only thing that he questioned was whether he had the guts to do what God wanted rather than what he wanted. Pleasing God over himself. That was the choice and the struggle. Now, if I go back to the subject of the woman's responsibility in marriage, and if we go to the New Testament, the pastor flipped the pages of his Bible to another well-worn section. It says here that the woman is to reverence her husband. She's also to submit to him. I think those two things are rather self-explanatory. He looked directly at Katie, who held his gaze. Flynn was rather proud of her. She didn't look angry, and she didn't look upset. She was listening, with a thoughtful expression on her face. You'd be amazed at what a woman standing behind her man can accomplish. I know in today's society we're all about ourselves. Me first. I'm taking care of myself. I'm seeking my own glory. That's what we hear. But there is a glory that is beautiful to God when we give up ourselves and our way. When a woman is a helper to her husband, respects him, and submits to him, it gives him confidence and authority in his home. It makes the woman beautiful in God's eyes. Again, I'm not making this stuff up. It's what God commanded us to do. But it's also wisdom. Proverbs says that a wise woman buildeth her house, but a fool plucketh it down with her hands. I think a foolish woman can also pluck it down with her words. Don't criticize. Use your words to build your man. Use the power that you have to build your house, to build your family. You won't regret it. He barely paused as his eyes shifted to Flynn. However, the man's responsibility is greater. Because while the Bible says that the head of the woman is the man, the Bible also tells us that the head of the man is God. She answers to you, he pointed from Katie to Flynn, then you answer to God. If you don't treat her right, if you don't protect her and provide for her, if you are unkind or abusive, her commands don't change. God doesn't give any outs, but you answer to her father, her daddy God. I wouldn't want to be you, standing in front of the throne, stuttering about why you didn't treat your wife, God's beloved daughter, the way you were commanded to. Even though Flynn had every intention of treating Katie just as well as he could, the idea of standing before God trying to explain why he neglected or ignored or made fun of his wife made his mouth go dry. And then here, the Bible says the husband is commanded to dwell with his wife according to knowledge. The pastor again looked up over the rim of his glasses. That means it is your responsibility to figure out your wife, to know her, to know what she likes and doesn't like, to know what she wants and doesn't want, to know what she needs, to know how to be considerate and thoughtful to her. I don't want to hear any of this bunk that you're a man and you weren't made that way. That's baloney. God knows how you were made, and it says right here it's your responsibility to figure it out, to get the knowledge. The pastor's voice got a little more strident than it had been almost like he was preaching to Flynn. It sounded like this was a point of passion for him. Indeed, his next words confirmed that. It's my experience that this is almost always where marriages go awry. Men don't take the time to learn their wives. They can't be bothered. They're too selfish. They don't think they can since they're male. They depend on their wives to carry the burden. And most women are content to allow that to happen. But a woman wasn't made to carry the burden. She was made to be protected. 
cared for, provided for. She's not strong enough to do that. The Bible says she's the weaker vessel. It might be talking physically, but I believe it's also talking mentally or spiritually, where a wife wasn't made to bear the stresses that the man was. When you make her do that, you hurt her, wound her, cause her to grow old before her time. You steal her joy. He held Flynn's eyes for just a moment before he looked back to Katie. I know you're listening, but you would be wise to never throw these words in his face. Your job is to do your job, regardless of what your husband does to you. So many women say, well, he doesn't do this or that, so I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to. The pastor smiled. You have children. Have you ever disciplined one of your children because they hit their brother and they said, but he made a face at me and so I had to hit him? Katie nodded, a little smile on her lips, like it had happened more than once. And I'm sure you say to them, I don't care what they do to you, it's never okay for you to hit them. Katie nodded again. It's the same here. Your command is to submit and obey, to reverence, to help. It doesn't matter what he does, whether he's nice to you or not, whether he obeys his command or not, whether he's a good man or not. God doesn't give you any exceptions. Possibly, by your behavior, your man, though he may not appreciate you at first, may eventually learn to do so. He might not. But when you stand before God, you can't point your finger at him and explain that he is the reason you didn't do what you were commanded to do. I'm not God, but I'm guessing he's not going to accept that excuse. You answer for what you do, how you kept your command, not how your husband kept his. Katie nodded, the look on her face still thoughtful, but she was smiling a little and if Flynn had to guess, he would say that Russell had not been the most thoughtful person, and Katie had still upheld the command she'd been given. It made him a little angry, because Russell didn't deserve the kind of wife he'd had, and he definitely should be held accountable for the pain he inflicted on her and on their children. Flynn knew God forgave, and if Russell truly repented, that would be forgiven as well, but Russell would still be rewarded for his works or the lack of them. There's so much more I'd like to say, but I hit the high notes, I think. The pastor steepled his hands over his Bible once more. Are there any questions? Before Flynn or Katie could say anything, there was a knock on the open study door, and Charlene's voice called out. Can I come in for a moment? She had asked if she could deliver her instructions before the wedding, and the pastor had said that would be fine. So they were expecting her. Perfect timing, Miss Charlene. You can come on in. I don't want to stay long, but I wanted to make sure that Flynn and Katie got this. She waved a piece of paper in the air. She walked to the desk and set the paper down face up between Flynn and Katie. Flynn couldn't help himself and looked down to see what was on the list. Charlene said something to the pastor, but Flynn was reading the paper. Number one, kiss the forehead each night for one week after you put the kids to bed. Number two, kiss the cheek each night for one week after you put the kids to bed. Number three, kiss the cheek and hug each other each night for one week after you put the kids to bed. Number four, kiss the lips and hug each night for one week after you put the kids to bed. Number five, kiss a romantic movie kiss each night for one week after you put the kids to bed. If you need instructions on romantic movie kissing, see Charlene. Number six, after you put the kids to bed, kiss romantic movie kiss, then go into the bedroom and shut the door. If you need instructions after this, see Charlene. 
it was all Flynn could do not to choke. He wasn't sure whether it was on laughter or embarrassment, or a potent combination of the two. Probably the latter. He kind of thought that Katie might be having the same issue, since her shoulders were shaking suspiciously, and an odd, strangled sound came from her throat. She lifted horrified eyes to his. He figured there was probably humor in his gaze, but he kind of thought he might look just as horrified as she did. Not because kissing her was so horrifying. It was the idea of having to see Charlene about the romantic movie kissing, or the closed bedroom door. He really, really wished he was alone with Katie right now. He figured they would probably laugh together, and then determine together that they would do everything they could not to have to talk to Charlene. Now you two already agreed to follow my schedule. She lifted her brows, and Flynn nodded, trying to make sure that the horrified feeling in his chest was not stamped all over his face anymore. He had agreed. That had been something that Charlene had insisted on when Katie had called to let her know that Katie had made her decision. At the time, Flynn had figured a kissing schedule was exactly what he wanted. But now, he felt maybe not too fast, just artificial. I expect to have weekly reports from both of you, and I expect both of you to keep your word. Katie nodded, but Flynn had to speak up. What if we want to go faster than what the schedule indicates? He wasn't sure, but it sounded like a giggle escaped Katie. He couldn't look at her, because he thought he might lose it too. Normally he didn't have too much trouble remaining unemotional, but the urge to laugh uncontrollably, possibly as a tension releaser, was almost more than he could stand. Charlene narrowed her eyes, as though she were trying to figure out whether this was a legitimate question or whether he was making some kind of unspoken joke. Finally, she must have realized he was serious. If there is a need to deviate from the schedule, you can check with me. But as long as you and Katie are in agreement, I just want to make sure you end up at the end. He nodded, still trying not to laugh or choke on the swirl of emotions he usually didn't have a problem containing. If that's everything, we can have the ceremony right now. And Charlene, you can be a witness. That'll save me from having to go get my wife. The pastor glanced at Flynn and Katie, and they both nodded. He pushed back away from his desk and stood up. Flynn figured that was his cue, and now that the time had come, his stomach rioted, and he wished he wouldn't have eaten breakfast, because it felt like it was going to come up even though it had been five hours before. He should be hungry, not feeling like he was going to puke. But he tried to school his features, because he didn't want Katie to look at him and think that he felt like he was going to puke, because she might get the wrong idea. It wasn't that he didn't want to get married. He did. Mostly. But it was a big step, a lifetime commitment and he couldn't imagine not being nervous. The pastor told them to clasp hands, and Katie trembled as she said hers, trusting in his. He wanted to put his arm around her and comfort her. The pastor had been clear that according to the Bible, it was his job to provide for her, to protect her, to know her, and to be kind and considerate and thoughtful toward her. He had a lot of work to do, because those were not qualities he had worked on much in his life. Now, he kind of wished that he would have used the first three decades or so of his life working to become the kind of man who would make a good husband, instead of feeling like he was starting out from scratch, with a lot of making up to do. He felt like Katie wasn't getting the very best man possible, that there was a lot of room for growth, it upset him because he wanted to give her the man she deserved, not the man he was. The ceremony was over way too quickly. The pastor skipped the kiss and just pronounced them man and wife. Flynn was a little grateful that he had skipped it, since he was pretty sure the first kiss he was supposed to give her was a forehead kiss, 
according to Miss Charlene's schedule. He wasn't sure whether a wedding kiss was excluded from that, or whether that was the kind of kiss he was supposed to do. Or maybe she was supposed to kiss his forehead. He couldn't remember whether the schedule specified who was supposed to kiss whom. He thanked the pastor, paid him, gave Miss Charlene a hug, and then grabbed the schedule in his wife's hand before they left the parsonage. Hopefully, he'd get used to his new role in life and stop worrying that he was going to mess up something. He looked at Katie. She looked as scared as he felt, and he figured once they got home and were alone, they could talk to each other, and he knew that would make him feel better. Talking to her before had eased his mind. There was just something about her that made him feel calm and confident. But in the meantime, he prayed. Chapter 13 You can be right or you can be married. I don't remember where I read this, but it has stuck with me for a long time. I continually choose to lay myself down and enjoy the ride wherever it takes us. Married for 39 years and counting. Lisa Quiller, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Please don't take this wrong, but I'm so glad that's over. Those were Katie's first words as Flynn slid into his pickup seat behind the steering wheel and started his truck. He paused his hand still on the starter as he looked over. Okay, I won't take that wrong, and don't take this wrong, but I'm 100% in agreement with you. She giggled, nervous giggles maybe, but maybe a release of tension as well. She truly was glad it was over. Not that she hadn't enjoyed it. Not that she hadn't gotten a lot out of the pastor's premarital counseling. Things she knew but just needed to be reminded of. And some things she hadn't thought about before. She appreciated that the pastor had not pulled any punches and hadn't bowed to the world's way of thinking, but had shown them clearly what the Bible said. Because that's what she wanted, to obey God, to please Him, to do His commands, because there was no way anything the world said or suggested could be better for marriage than what the Creator commanded. After all, God loved her. The world did not. You realize how deceived society is? Flynn said, almost as though he were reading her mind. Maybe he'd taken that whole dwell with his wife according to knowledge seriously. Rather than teasing him about it, she took his subject and went with it. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of this world, and he's done the job he set out to do, deceived people. It's sad. I guess as I was thinking about it, though, I don't ever want to be one of those people who are deceived and don't know it, you know? I think that's why it's so important to read your Bible every day. It's so easy to start thinking that what the world says is right. After all, it makes sense, and it's what we want. Please yourself. You don't have to do anything to someone else that they don't do to you first. If someone treats you badly, they're toxic, so you need to cut them out of your life. Those are all things that appeal to our flesh, our humanness. But God calls us to something higher and we have to remind ourselves of that daily, or, in my case, sometimes second by second. She was quiet for a bit, because it was true. Sometimes she lost her way. She needed the Bible, needed it on a daily basis in order for her to not be deceived by the seductive call of the world. I'm with you in the second by second, although sometimes, most of the time, I know what the Bible says, and I know what I need to do. I just don't want to. I have that problem, too. I suppose being teachable is an important quality. And being willing to admit that you're wrong and need to do better. Yeah, it's that pride thing. No one wants to admit they're wrong. No one wants to admit that they have to do better. 
It's hard. You think it makes you look worse, but if people are thinking about it the right way, it actually makes you look better. Although the way you look shouldn't matter. Not the way you look to anyone except God, anyway. Flynn nodded, and they drove in silence, thinking. He pulled into her driveway before he spoke again. I took the entire day off today. Is there something you want me to do? She looked up, surprised. I was going to make a meal. I should have prepared earlier, but I guess we decided kind of late that today was the day, and I didn't have groceries, so I needed to get them after the kids went to school this morning. So we're going to cook together? I'm pretty sure that I'm supposed to be the keeper of the house, so don't feel like you have to. Maybe I want to spend a little time with my wife. He grinned. Wow, that feels kind of weird. Wife. I never had one of those before. Well, you know I've had a husband, but not one I had so much confidence in. If he noticed that she didn't say anything about love or even affection, he didn't show it. She could say with confidence that she definitely felt affection for him, but she wasn't sure what love was. The emotion, anyway. She knew love was an action, and she felt confident she could show that. There might be things he did which would irritate her, and she was sure there were going to be things she did that could irritate him, but those were minor inconveniences that they could work through as long as they were on the same page about the important things, and she knew they were. He was turning the truck off as she said, You know, it's crazy, but while I'm nervous, today was a big day, a big step. I have so much confidence in our marriage. Is that nuts? Especially considering how little time we spent together. We've never gone on a date. That we've never even kissed. He grinned a little. But I have Charlene's list, so we'll take care of that. She laughed, trying to pretend that the idea didn't make her stomach want to fly to South Africa. What are we making? He asked after they got out of the truck and walked up the walk to the side door. I called your sister and asked her what your favorites were. So, as per Sadie, we're having ham, mashed potatoes, and beets. She nailed it. Although, she could have done one better and given you the recipe for the brown sugar pineapple ham that she makes. Man, that stuff is so awesome. You can go ahead and thank her right now if you want to, because she gave me the recipe, and I have all the ingredients for it since I went to the store this morning and got them. She held up her phone, wiggling it back and forth. You're kidding. Dead serious. Are you really going to help me? Sure. I've never made it before, though. I know there's brown sugar and pineapple in it. I think it'll be fun to putter around in the kitchen. It is. I love cooking. I just don't always love cleaning up the mess afterward. He opened the door for her, and she walked through. They put their things down. Then Flynn grabbed a magnet from the refrigerator and pinned the kissing schedule up on the side. Right where they would see it, but where it wouldn't be obvious for the kids. Is this okay? He asked as he nodded toward the kissing schedule. It sure is. Miss Charlene seemed to think that it was pretty important that we stuck to it. She went to the sink to wash her hands. Flynn came over beside her and used the faucet after her. I noticed that, but I had to wonder if it would be better for us to do it on our own schedule. I wondered if maybe she was afraid we wouldn't. You know, like we would just get into a comfortable routine and not move forward. Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't considered that. I've heard married couples get into a rut. Yeah, kind of like that, where we wouldn't bestir ourselves to move forward. Although. I don't know. She tried not to show her insecurity and her anxiousness over the whole idea. She liked Flynn, really liked him, but she wasn't sure she liked him quite like that. 
He didn't say anything but dried his hands while she pulled the recipe up on her phone and grabbed the ham from the refrigerator. Do you want to unwrap that? She asked, setting the ham down on the counter. Sure. While he worked on taking the wrapper off, she grabbed the bag of brown sugar, glanced at the phone, and then started shaking it in the bottom of the crock pot, which she had set right beside him. Aren't you measuring? He glanced at the recipe, which was still lit up on her phone. It clearly said to put two cups of sugar in the bottom of the crock pot. Nope, just gonna eyeball it. As soon as she said it, his brows lowered, and she remembered how important it was for him to toe the line. She lifted the bag up and bit her lip. Is that going to bother you? He moved his head first to one side, then the other, and his neck cracked each time. He shifted his shoulders back. I'll try to let it go. I think this is one of our differences, one of the main ones that will probably end up annoying us about each other. My tendency to skip over the details and your tendency to get stuck in them? He gave a self-deprecating grin. <laughs> yeah, that. Well, it's kind of too late for me to measure the sugar exactly now, unless you want me to scrape it out of the crock pot. No, I told you. I'm pretty sure I can handle it. All right, that's fine. But I'll measure the brown sugar that goes on top. How's that? No, you do it exactly the way you're going to do it. This is your domain, and you're going to be the main person in the kitchen. I'm not going to come in here and start telling you what to do. Maybe, maybe if it's something that's really important to me, we can either do it my way or compromise a little more. But for this one, let's do it your way. And if I need to breathe into a paper bag, I'll just go do that. She was pretty sure he was joking about the paper bag and figured she was right when he laughed with her. Be careful when you unwrap the ham. There's probably going to be some juice at the bottom and we can either pour that in the crock pot or just make sure it doesn't spill on the counter. She hoped she wasn't bossing too much, but he'd admitted that he wasn't used to being in the kitchen and probably wouldn't realize that the ham could really make a mess. Got it, thanks. He didn't seem upset that she'd given him a suggestion. Russell would have been defiant, and whatever she told him to do, he would have done the exact opposite, probably ending up making more of a mess. She hadn't really said that to Flynn to test him, but she smiled to herself. What does that smile mean? It means you passed the test, she said airily, because she was just being goofy. It hadn't really been a test. I didn't realize you were testing me. You should warn me next time so I can study. I'm kidding. I was just thinking that if I would have said that to Russell, he would have done the exact opposite and I was smiling because that just confirmed what I had been feeling all along, that this time I made a brilliant decision, and I have a really awesome man. She grinned and hadn't really thought about her words, until the smile lit up his face. He liked her compliment, and she hadn't even thought about it, just said the truth. Then he busied himself pulling the ham out of the wrapper, setting it carefully in the crock pot. She watched him for a minute and then glanced at the recipe again, but she was distracted. He had liked her compliment. It had made him feel good. It made her happy to know that she had told him the truth, something she might not have said if she'd been thinking about it, and it had made him smile and lifted him up. She wanted to make sure that she complimented him more. After all, words were free, but words unsaid were opportunities missed. Although, she didn't want to fall into the trap of just saying whatever came into her head, whether it was true or not, just to make him feel good. That wasn't honest. After he set the ham in the crock pot, she showed him how to separate the spiral slices before they put the honey and pineapple on. Despite what he had said, she measured the brown sugar for the top. They were together, chatting easily, and she realized that that she really liked his company. Always had, but maybe she'd never really appreciated him when they were younger. She didn't remember him being so thoughtful and funny. 
Maybe the kissing schedule wasn't going to make her as nervous as she had thought. Chapter 14 Commitment to God and Commitment to Making the Marriage Last A Kiss in the Morning and a Kiss at Night Before Sleeping Joyce Fogelman from Louisiana, married 54 years The meal was ready. All it needed to do was cook. Flynn was a little shocked to realize he'd had an amazing time. He never dreamed cooking could be so much fun. He could be wrong, but he thought Katie had a good time too. She'd done a lot of laughing. Her eyes sparkled and her skin glowed. She was nervous at the wedding, but he had been too. That kind of commitment, that kind of vow before an almighty God was enough to scare anyone. He definitely couldn't blame her for that. He only hoped she felt the same about him and didn't take his nervousness as a sign he hadn't wanted to get married. He'd always known Katie was a good friend, but being with her, working with her, made him think that maybe there really could be more. Still, their relationship couldn't be all fun, and while he was a little nervous about bringing the subject up, he felt like this might be a good time. They still had an hour before the kids got home from school, and while he had no experience with children, with him going back to work tomorrow and Katie the next day, it might be a while before they had some uninterrupted time to talk. So he said, How do you feel about going over our finances? She had just washed the last dish and was letting the water out of the sink drain. Her head came up, her eyes got big, and then something that looked like panic entered into them. I've been dreading the moment where I was going to have to show you exactly how bad things are. Don't dread it, and I might not be totally shocked. The peacemakers insinuated that part of the reason they wanted you to get married, and soon, was because financially you needed to. That was tactful, he thought. Sometimes, particularly when he got deeply involved in numbers, he had a tendency to just state facts and not soften them with kind words. He thought he did okay because she nodded. I didn't talk to them about the details, but I guess it's not exactly a secret in town that I've been struggling. It's not your fault. Someone made promises to you. You believed them, and rightfully so, and they didn't keep those promises. Don't feel like this is something that you have to apologize for. He stopped. Then he added, It's just something you have to work through, and I'm here to help if you'll let me. She sighed deeply and looked at the ground. You might not have a choice. She gave another small sigh, then dried her hands off on the dish towel. Come into the living room. I have a small desk in the corner, and that's where I keep everything. And honestly, our marriage happened so fast, I didn't even have a thought in my head of the fact that I probably should have warned you about this before we said, I do. I, I guess I had other things on my mind. The kissing schedule, for example, he said, never dreaming in a million years that he would have used the kissing schedule as an object to lighten up a conversation. For him, it produced mostly anxiety, although a small amount of curiosity, if he were being honest. He supposed anxiety was probably the only feeling it elicited from Katie, except for now, when she laughed, outright laughed, and looked back at him with a relieved smile on her face. Odd thing to joke about, but it worked. He allowed himself to smile back at her, liking that he was able to ease her mind and make her laugh. He liked making her laugh, liked being the one that made her happy, wanted to see it happen more often. But as they walked side by side to the desk, he grew more serious. He didn't usually joke when he was working with numbers. This is where I keep everything, she said, opening a drawer and pulling out a checkbook and a stack of bills. Stamped in red on the front of several were the words, past due. 
the most serious bill that I can't pay is the mortgage. I, I let it go some because I was planning on selling the house. After talking to a realtor at their recommendation, I put some money into a few repairs, thinking it would sell faster. Although I had a couple of unexpected bills, my furnace went out. That was the big one. I couldn't sell the house with no furnace. Also, Raymond was at the emergency room, and I had to pay the copay while I was standing there. And then they were the most aggressive at trying to collect the money I owed. Her words were soft and low, like she was ashamed of not being able to pay her bills. It made Flynn angry to think that her husband was having a high time with his new girlfriend, while the woman that he'd pledged his life to, then dumped, was struggling to pay bills that he'd left her with, along with their three children. I also have a credit card that I've been trying to make the minimum payment on, the electric bill, and basic necessities. I have everything shut off that we don't absolutely need. Have you talked to Russell about the emergency room bill? Or paying half the mortgage? I have. When he'll talk to me. If I bring up money, he usually quits texting me, so I've stopped doing it unless he's standing in front of me. At that point, he always promises that he'll send me a check, and he never does. She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know what to do. Isn't he paying child support? The bare minimum. He convinced the judge... He can be very charming. Katie gave Flynn an apologetic glance, like somehow it was a bad reflection on her to say that her ex-husband was charming. And he acted like he really wanted to have custody of the children, and I wouldn't let him. She pulled both lips in and bit down before she said, And that's kind of true. He offered a lot to take them, and at first I refused. I hated the idea that he was being a family with my kids with some other woman. It hurt. In a way I can't even explain. It made me angry, almost violently so. The idea that he would just kick me out and insert another woman and sit around the supper table, saying grace and then chatting with my kids, and that he would be teaching my kids that was okay. She looked away, out the window. I struggled for a while with that. And so, yeah, I did turn it down when he offered to take them, or more likely when the kids begged him to take them, and he would say, if your mom says it's okay. I don't blame you. <laughs> but then, one time after really struggling and praying about it, I finally said, go ahead. She laughed without humor. <laughs> At that point, he started backpedaling and floundering, and then came up with a million excuses for the kids as to why he couldn't. But at that point, it was too late. He'd already told the judge that he'd like to share custody, but I wouldn't allow it. The judge lowered his child support in return for giving me more time with the kids. He said something about if the dad wants to spend time with them and the mom won't let him, then the mom shouldn't make the dad pay like he's just an ATM and not a father. I can't believe a judge would say that. It surprised me, too, although it makes sense in a way. So, I don't know what was in his past. Maybe he'd been burned by an ex, too. Whatever it was, I'm just getting a tiny bit of money from Russell, and that's sporadic. If I want it to be more dependable, I'm going to have to go back to court, and... I just don't have the emotional reserves to fight him right now. Flynn didn't have a problem figuring that out. He could see how she probably just wanted it all to be put in her past, without having to have constant reminders of what she considered her failure thrown up in her face all the time. Everything you said makes sense to me. It made him angry, too, but he figured that wasn't necessary for him to say. But I don't think that you should take the blame for any of it, though I admire you taking responsibility. That was the truth. Thank you. Her words were soft, spoken quickly, and he got the impression that she felt like there weren't too many people who felt like he did, or at least told her they felt that way. I don't think that anyone blames you. 
I think you're wrong. I think a lot of people look at me and think, I must have done something wrong to make my husband not want me anymore. Maybe I wasn't kind enough to him. Maybe I didn't treat him well. Maybe I was cold or wasn't sexy enough or something. Everyone says it takes two. I'm not saying there weren't things that you could have done better, but I don't think that there is a single marriage in the entire world where both of the people in it could look back on what they've done and say, I couldn't do anything better. That's why we're human, and that's why we need redemption, because we're not perfect. She nodded, although he had the feeling that she didn't necessarily believe him. Hey. He put a hand on her shoulder, then touched her chin, turning her face to look at him. That's in the past. You're better because of it. You can use it to be better. I know. It's actually something I've been working hard on. Because, almost worse than losing Russell, who, honestly, after I got over the first shock of him cheating, was easy to hate, it was the idea of the fact that I knew I would never have a golden anniversary. I grew up dreaming of it. Being married to the same man all my life, I never thought I would be a divorcee. Never thought I would have a broken home. Never thought I would raise my children without their father. I just, I worked so hard to make the things I wanted to have come true. That's the problem with dreams that take two people. Both of you have to be on board. Even if Russell had the same dreams at one point, he obviously didn't care enough about them to put in the effort and work required to make them happen. I know, I know. That's something I've learned. I can only do me. Anything that takes two, I just have to pull my fingers away and let God handle it. Not even just a marriage. Even my relationship with my kids. I have certain dreams and things I want to see happen in their lives. I want them to love Jesus and grow up to serve him, but that's not something I can control any more than I can control my husband. That's exactly right. Even when you're working, I suppose as a waitress you probably see it all the time. You can give the best service you possibly can, but if the cook doesn't give you good food, there's only so much you can do. Exactly. It makes me want to just have a business where it's only me, where my reputation is just me and what I do, and I don't depend on someone else. That's a nice idea, but that's not really what God wants, is it? He wants us to work with other imperfect people, lifting them up, encouraging them, giving them as much of ourselves as we can, without expecting anything in return. So, while you could be, for example, a painter, just painting your own works, never having to deal with anyone else, God really wants us to walk along and help others. Not a million others, just the people he puts around us. Our co-workers, our family and friends too, of course. Maybe sometimes we go shallow and try to help too many people, and we can't do that very well, can't invest deeply in 50 people. But is there one person we can pick up? That's a great point. We think having scads of friends makes us popular, but no one has enough time or energy to invest in tons of people. Nothing more than a surface relationship which is kind of what happens when we're friends with people on social media. Click a button on their post or reel or whatever, and you're a good friend. But the painter can have a secretary, or a publicist, or an agent, and they can allow society to dictate the way they treat those people, keep them as business relationships, making money is the important thing. Or they can pour themselves into that relationship and make it something better more like a relationship Jesus would have. Chapter 15 Love means often having to say, I'm sorry, and please forgive me too. Kay Whitten Katie nodded thoughtfully, like she'd never considered what Flynn had said. He supposed he'd never articulated it quite that way before. As a mom, 
it's easy to pour myself into my children. Although, when they give me a hard time, it's hard to hide the hurt and keep doing what I know is right. I want to be angry, especially when they blame me for the divorce. I want to grab hold of them and shake them and make them see the truth. And that's just it, isn't it? They won't see the truth if we force it into them. But if we walk along beside them and they see us, see our walk, our behavior, the way we treat others, then they might start to question the lies they've been told. That it's your fault, that it was something you had done, that you were the bad guy. It will come out in the wash, to use an old expression, but it's a matter of whether or not you walk right through it, keeping your Christian testimony the whole time. That's so hard. I can do it like 95% of the time, but it's that 5% when I lose it that everyone remembers. I can attest to that. Looking back, I know my dad was always patient and kind, more so than us boys deserved, I'm sure. He probably deserved sainthood, since he had so many boys to handle and was so patient. But the times that I remember vividly are the three times that he lost his temper. One time, he threw an entire basket of clothes out of an upstairs window, and that's the kind of thing a kid remembers. But as I've gotten older, I remember that most of the time, I just felt like it was normal that he was happy and patient. And I don't remember those times because they were so banal. That hardly seems fair, but I think that's true. My kids remember the times I lost it although I never threw a basket of clothes out the window. She laughed. I did throw a spatula at the wall. I promise I wasn't throwing it at anyone. I was just so angry. It was probably less than a week after Russell had left, and after the first time the kids had gone to see him. Debbie had told me that Robin was a better cook than I was. Flynn shifted because she paused awkwardly, her eyes filling with tears. He wanted to do more than just touch her chin, and so he allowed his hand to slide around her neck. Hey, I know that had to hurt. It did. On top of all the other pain that I was feeling, on top of every inadequacy I ever had, at least I thought that Russell had chosen the lesser of two women if he compared Robin and me side by side. But to have my children tell me that she was the better woman too. Cooking isn't everything. No. Character is more important, and I would never, ever, not in a million years, not if someone held a gun to my head, go out with a man who was married and had three small children with someone else. That shows a complete and total lack of integrity, but... Her voice had started to tremble with the force of her anger, and she cut off abruptly. I'm sorry. Obviously, it still hurts. Not that I moon after Russell, but the idea that my family is broken. I don't know that that's something that will ever not hurt. But I do think that time probably dulls the pain. And you can look at it from the perspective of someone who has an opportunity to build something new. Someone who has been married for 50 years never has the opportunity to go into a new marriage with more wisdom to choose more wisely than she did to begin with, to start building with a decade of knowledge under her belt, the way you do right now. <laughs> I see that. I hadn't thought of it that way before. You have all those things you learned, all those hard lessons, all that pain. That will make you more empathetic toward other people. And even that comparison that hurt, it can drive you to Jesus because he doesn't see Robin as a better person than you. He loves you with a deep, abiding love, and it's not the idea that your worth is whether or not you're better than some other human. It's the idea that your worth is because you're a child of God, and he loves you. That's your worth. Not in what your husband thinks. Although I think you're pretty awesome, he said eliciting a smile from her as she looked at him from underneath her lashes, wet with a few tears. And it's not in what the town thinks of you or even what your kids think of you. 
It's just every day you try to be more like Jesus and know that because of Christ, you have worth beyond measure. She closed her eyes, smiling a little, then opened them and looked up at him. I know all of that, every single word that you just said, but it's so nice to be reminded of it all. Thank you. Exactly what I needed. For so long, there hasn't been anyone to tell me that when I get down on myself, and I appreciate you taking the time and having the patience. So thank you. He smiled, just a little, and then his expression grew serious. I think the kissing schedule told me that today I'm allowed to kiss your forehead. If you don't mind, I think I'd like to do that now. I wasn't sure whether it was you kissing my forehead or me kissing yours, but since it's harder for me to reach your forehead and you can reach mine, I guess this'll work. He had started to lean down, but his lips quirked up at her words. <laughs> I had wondered the same thing. Who was kissing whom? I suppose, if Charlene asks for our feedback, we'll have to tell her she needs to be more specific on her kissing schedule. <laughs> I bet that will surprise her, Katie said dryly. But then her eyes closed as his lips touched her forehead. She smelled good, like strawberries and vanilla with a little bit of apple mixed in. And to his surprise, he didn't really want to straighten back up. But if they were going to get any of the financial situation figured out before the kids came, they needed to get started on it. An hour later, Flynn had made a small dent in figuring out how they were going to handle everything. Considering that he had been living in his dad's garage with minimal expenses for more than ten years, he had a good bit of money saved away. He knew he was going to be using it when he married Katie, and he would have more than enough to bring their mortgage up to date and pay all the other bills. He had just finished going over everything that he could do with Katie, who sat patiently and quietly beside him as he looked things over. Once we're caught up, I should be able to easily pay all the bills that we have together with what I make for my job. So, I know you were listening when the pastor was talking about the various responsibilities of a woman and a man in marriage, and I'll leave it up to you. If you think working will make you feel more fulfilled or give you more security, because you were caught flat-footed like you had told me earlier, and don't want to be that dependent again, you can keep doing it. I'm not going to insist, but if you want to quit, we can afford for you to. She sat quietly and then nodded. I know you'll be okay if I think about it, but it's nice to know that I don't have to stress if things are slow at the diner and my shifts get cut. No, you don't. And as far as I'm concerned, you can keep that money in the account that has just your name on it and use it for whatever you want to. Thanks for being so considerate, she said, her smile saying more than her words that she was overwhelmed and could hardly believe that she had been blessed with such a wonderful husband. Maybe he was reading it all wrong, but she sure looked like she was admiring him in a way he could never remember anyone doing before. It made him feel good, warm and happy inside but it made him a little uncomfortable, too. Hey, I have something for you. I forgot all about it. You do? Well, I have a few things for you, but just one right now. She looked shocked, her lips pursed, her brows lifted. I never even thought... That's fine. I just had a couple ideas, and, well, I hope they were good ideas. He stood and grabbed her hand pulling her along to the front door, which she never used. It connected to a porch where he had asked Miss Charlene to put his ponytail tree earlier while they were at the wedding. He hoped she remembered. And sure enough, when he opened the door, it sat there, only three feet high, with palm-like leaves coming out and flowing down and definitely giving the impression of a woman's ponytail. Someone told me you like plants, and I thought, what better gift to get her on her wedding day than a tree? It might not last as long as we do, 
but I just like the idea of something with roots better than something that would fade and be gone in a few weeks. I like that idea, too. Although cut flowers are pretty as well, they brighten the room for a bit. But... Her hand went to her chest as her eyes landed on the tree that he had bought. It's so pretty, like a waterfall. It's called a ponytail tree. Oh, that's so fitting. It does look like a ponytail the way the leaves come down. She walked out, touching a leaf, looking at the short trunk and the decorative pot. Is it inside or outside? Inside. It never loses its leaves, or so I've been told, and it doesn't need to have direct sunlight, so it should grow anywhere we put it in the house. It doesn't even need to be watered regularly. At least that's what I was told as well. Wow, that sounds perfect. That's my downfall, remembering to water, especially when everyone is sick or we have some kind of busy time, like a concert or performance at school to prepare for. I considered a cactus, but I thought this was so pretty. And so thoughtful. I can't believe you heard me whenever I said how much I liked plants. It was just something in passing, but it made an impression. She turned, wrapping her arms around him. I know Miss Charlene said no hugging until week three, but surely I'm allowed to give you a hug if I want to thank you for a gift. She said she just wanted us to do everything on the list. I think it's okay to improvise a little. He knew there was some humor in his voice. It wasn't that he was making fun of Miss Charlene's list. It was that he loved that they could laugh about it. Loved that Miss Charlene cared for and loved them enough to have made it, to push them and make sure they didn't allow their marriage to be less than what it could be. He appreciated her wisdom. He also found it amusing that, after one day with Katie, improvising sounded good to his straight-laced nature. She might be good for him after all. Chapter 16 Being willing to walk 100% of the way to the other person, even if you think you are right. Susan Nixon Katie couldn't believe that Flynn had been so thoughtful. He didn't seem like the kind of man who went around trying to figure out what would be the perfect gift, but he really nailed it with the tree. She loved that it was something permanent, something that would remind her of their wedding day for years to come. Every time she watered it, every time she looked at its graceful beauty, every time it cheered up her room and made her smile. She hoped she didn't kill it. She had a tendency to do that to plants. But if it truly didn't need to be watered on a regular basis, she might be okay with it. She didn't really have words to tell him how appropriate the gift was and how appreciative she was. And she didn't have time to think of any because the back door opened. Cassie, who had finally recovered from her latest treatment, had asked if she could pick up the kids on their wedding day to give them just a little more time together. She wanted to do something and had explained that there wasn't much that she could do, but the wedding just happened to fall on the week she wasn't taking chemo and she could make a short trip to the school. She had often picked the kids up for Katie when she worked at the diner and they'd get home at the same time. Cassie would just park at her house and the kids would run over easy for everyone. Today, Katie had taken her up on it, more because she wanted Cassie to feel useful and helpful than because she really felt like she would need the time. But considering that Flynn and she had not run out of things to say or do, she truly did appreciate Cassie's thoughtfulness. Hey, Mom, Gwen said, coming into the room. What's that? She walked over, her head tilted. It's kind of pretty. It's called a ponytail tree. Mr. Flynn gave it to me for our wedding. Oh, that's right. You were supposed to get married today. She turned her head and looked at Flynn the same way she'd examined the ponytail tree. Hi, she finally said. Flynn, this is Gwen. She's my middle child. Hey, Gwen, 
Flynn said, sounding at ease, but he'd stiffened some, and Katie thought it was important to him that her children like him. Hi, can I go play? Gwen asked, her total unconcern about Flynn making Katie smile. Change your clothes first. I know, Mom, Gwen said, skipping out of the room. That's not what you were supposed to say. Katie's voice was firm. Yes, ma'am. That's better. Don't forget today's garbage day, and it's your turn to take it out. Katie called after her. I know, Mom, Gwen called down the hall. Gwen? Yes, ma'am. Raymond stood in the doorway. At seven, he was the most shy of her children and the most likely to stand back, just looking. This is Raymond. He's been the man of the family for the last year. He smiled under her praise as she walked over and gave him a hug, which he returned. You remember Mr. Flynn? Hey there, Flynn said easily, and she loved that he was so relaxed around her kids. Even though he mentioned to her at some point that he'd never been around children before. Hi, are you living here from now on? I sure am. We'll be doing some things with him, although not really today. Although we have a nice supper planned, so work up an appetite. I can play until supper, he asked eagerly, moving quickly for the first time toward the stairs. Yeah. You're not my dad, and you never will be, Debbie said as she walked into the room, her eyes narrowed, anger and distrust evident on her face. For a moment, Katie bit her tongue, remembering how easily Debbie had accepted Robin how she told Katie that Robin's cooking was better than hers, how she had said how beautiful Robin's house was, how she had a bedroom to herself in Robin's house, how she didn't have to do the dishes at Robin's house. It seemed like she was constantly telling Katie how she didn't measure up to Robin. Katie supposed it would be too much for her to accept Flynn as easily as she had seemed to accept Robin. Although what was actually going on in her brain was anyone's guess. Debbie, it doesn't matter how you feel about a person. In this house, you will be required to be polite, or you will be punished for disrespect and rudeness. She kept her voice down, speaking low, but she didn't take Debbie out to a private area. Flynn was going to be a part of their family, and Debbie was going to have to understand that as much as Katie wished it were some other way. She'd no sooner thought that than she realized, if it were some other way, it wouldn't be Flynn standing there. And the more time she spent around him, the more she knew that whatever she had lost in her first marriage, God had more than given her back in her second. Flynn was a man any woman would be proud to have as a husband, blessed to have as a husband. Debbie's scowl didn't dissipate, but she said, Nice to meet you, sounding like it was anything but nice to meet him. You look just like your mom, Debbie, Flynn said, the easy note in his voice having changed slightly into something that sounded a little more reserved. Katie couldn't blame him, but she hoped eventually Debbie would accept and grow to love Flynn. He certainly deserved it from her. I told the other two they could change their clothes and play until supper time. She'd just finished speaking when there was a knock on the back door, the one they normally used. I think that might be the other thing that was supposed to come today. Other thing, she said, and then she remembered that he had mentioned when he told her about the ponytail tree that he'd gotten her something else as well. Oh, my goodness, you really didn't need to do anything. And now I feel terrible that I did nothing. Don't feel terrible. And you might want to gather the kids around for this one. I think they might like it. Debbie still stood glaring at them. Then she crossed her arms over her chest and flounced out of the room, not saying anything. Katie didn't correct her, although she made a note to talk to her later about body language being rude as well as words. I'm sorry about that she said to Flynn. He shook his head. 
I would be the same way if my dad left and my mom tried to replace him with someone else. I just can't imagine it happening. I feel bad for her having to go through that. It's no excuse to be rude. She needs to have manners no matter how she feels. And that includes her body language. I'll definitely be saying something to her. Flynn lifted his shoulder, then grabbed her hand. You coming, or are we just going to let this person stand at the door all day? Oh, I guess we do need to answer the door. She turned and called over her shoulder. Kids, come down. There's something we need to see. She couldn't imagine what it was, but if Flynn said the kids would enjoy it, she wasn't going to doubt him. Raymond and Gwen had reached her side by the time she answered the door. She didn't know Tig well, but she recognized Ellen as a kid from Debbie's class at school. Well, hello. How are you? We have a delivery for you today. We were just wondering where you want them. A delivery? She asked, her hand coming to her chest, her eyes going from Tig to Flynn, who was grinning. Aye. Just then, a cow bawled and Katie's eyes grew big as she shifted them from looking at Flynn and focused on what was behind Tig, a truck pulling a stock trailer. Was that a cow? This is a surprise, I see, Tig said, lifting his brows at Flynn, who nodded. Maybe you want to come check them out before you tell me where you want them. Katie laughed, thinking, but not sure, that Flynn might have actually gotten her a cow for a wedding gift. A cow? She couldn't believe it. It was perfect for her, exactly what she would have wanted if she'd thought about it. She certainly didn't want a toaster or a blender or something that just represented work to her. She wanted something fun, something she had longed for for a long time but had not had the money to get and certainly had never thought she would actually have. Not since Russell had left. Before then, she'd hoped, but Russell had always said no. She hadn't argued. She understood that owning a cow was a big deal, and they couldn't have one just because she took a fancy to them. Both of them had to be on board. At least in a good relationship, that's the way it would be. There was another moo which caused the children to jump up and down. Is that a cow? Did you get a cow? They were looking at her, and she shook her head. I didn't get a cow. This was all Mr. Flynn's doing. She was pretty sure that Flynn had gotten a cow because she had mentioned that she wanted one, and she was honestly super excited about it. What kind of cow? She supposed she didn't care. Any cow would be fun. It had been a brilliant move on his part, although she doubted he'd considered the kids' excitement. They would be thrilled, plus it was a wonderful opportunity for him to show that he was different than Russell. Let's go check them out, Flynn said easily, looking over his shoulder as though checking to see if Debbie was coming. She appreciated that consideration that he wasn't holding it against her, that she didn't accept him right away. Katie didn't say that, though, just gave him an appreciative smile as they set out of the house and followed Tig to the trailer. I think the best thing for me to do is back up wherever you think you may want them, and we'll let them out so you can get a good eyeball on them. Right now, you have to step up on the side of the trailer and try to look between the slats. I can open the gate, and you can back right up through the yard to the pasture. In all the time they lived there, almost eight years, nothing had been in the pasture. A couple of times a year, a neighbor came and made hay so it didn't get too overgrown. Right now, it was just greening up and would provide plenty of food for the cow on the trailer. She wasn't an expert on cows, but the noise seemed to come from a young cow. Maybe it was a calf. They stood back while Tig moved the trailer and back to where Flynn had opened the gate. Then they all lined up along the fence while Tig opened the gate and stepped back. She had a feeling Flynn was watching her, 
but she forgot all about it when not one, but two calves stepped off the trailer. They were small, tiny, but they didn't look like newborns. They're so beautiful and small. They're miniatures. They shouldn't take too much hay or grass, and fully grown, they'll only be about twice the size of what they are now, so definitely a size we can all handle. They're Highlanders. Yep, miniature Highlanders. Didn't you know that Ford Hansen breeds them just outside of town? <laughs> I should have known that. I work at the diner and everything gets talked about there, but no, I've never heard that. She had no idea. It was hard to close her mouth and even harder to keep from jumping up and down. The kids were practically levitating. Are they tame? Can we pet them? Ellen bottle fed them. They're nice and tame, and you can walk right up and pet them. I did when I was picking them out. In fact, they came over to the fence to me, just like they're doing now. And sure enough, the calves had heard them talking and had made their way over to the fence. They went to Ellen first, and she explained to the kids where they liked to be scratched. Debbie appeared beside Ellen, which made Katie smile, because Debbie seemed just as excited about the calves as her two younger siblings. Plus, she was friends with Ellen, so Ellen directed most of her talking to Debbie. The calves sniffed at the hands her kids held through the fence as Tig and Flynn talked softly behind her. Tig was giving a few last-minute instructions and Katie turned around. They're not still being bottle-fed, she asked, when Tig had finished his sentence. No, they've been weaned for two weeks. They should be fine on grass, and you have plenty, although if you want to give them a little grain once in a while, it won't hurt anything. Are they siblings? Aye, twins. Tig went on to explain a little of what happened and why they were bottle-fed and that they could be bred in another six months or so. She was so excited she could hardly contain herself, but she stood back while the kids petted them and ooed and awed over them, going into the pasture and hugging them while the calves sniffed and licked them, and stood while Ellen showed them all the places they loved to be scratched. It was more than an hour before Tig and Ellen left, and Katie told the kids to go in and wash up for supper. Thank you. This was the most amazing gift anyone could have ever given me. I can't even believe you thought of it, let alone accomplished getting them here in such a short amount of time, especially with everything that was going on. They, along with the tree, are the most amazing gifts ever. I wouldn't have even said that I was a gift person, but you've made me feel valued and loved. Thank you. Flynn, who was so often stoic and serious, couldn't keep the grin off of his face. Her words had made it grow bigger, and he looked as happy as she'd ever seen him. I'm glad you liked them. I wanted to make you smile. You're taking a chance, and I know it's hard for you. I just wanted you to know that I intend for this marriage to be fun for both of us. And yeah, I think fun. Sure, it's a covenant, and sure, it's our relationship, and I get that life is not peaches and roses all the time, but there's no reason why we can't look at our lives as a happy time. I want to make it so. Isn't that just as easy as being grumpy all the time? She loved his perspective. She'd never considered that she would go into a relationship thinking it would be fun. She always thought she wanted romance wanted to be good at her job, whether that was being a wife or being a mother or being a friend. It didn't occur to her to think about it in terms of enjoyment, both hers and his. You've been a great example to me. All day long, I've been learning things I want to put into practice. In fact, the entire short time you and I have been talking about this, you've been an inspiration to me. Thank you. He huffed out a laugh. I don't think Miss Charlene's paper said how many times per day I was allowed to kiss you on the forehead. So, if it's okay with you, I'm going to kiss you again. 
she laughed outright. The paper hadn't stipulated how many kisses they were to give, or even if there was more than one. It just specified location and time frame. I can't wait until we're allowed to kiss somewhere other than the forehead because I can't reach yours. Maybe I'll catch you at supper when you're sitting down. Speaking of that, I bet that ham is just about perfect right now, and I'm starving. I feel bad I didn't get you any gifts, but I did go shopping with you in mind, and I'm really hoping the meal turns out. I'm sure it will. I was there when we made it, and it looked delicious. All my favorites. They stared into each other's eyes, smiling, as he put his arm around her shoulders, and they walked into the house together. Her first wedding had been bigger, a white dress, bridesmaids, a church, and music, and the whole nine yards. But this wedding had been by far the happier. Not just because she hadn't had the pressure of making the day perfect, but because her husband had made her feel valued and appreciated and wanted. Funny, since he'd never said that he loved her, and they'd never even kissed. But she felt loved and cherished by Flynn right now, more than she ever had with Russell. Interesting how moments of thoughtfulness could completely change a relationship and her attitude toward them. She only hoped she could be as thoughtful as he had been. Chapter 17 If you want him to treat you like a queen, you need to treat him like a king. Take care of your man. Meet his needs, but also his wants. Compliment him often, especially in the presence of others. Love him like God wants you to, and make him feel special. Jill Tatum, from Ruston, Louisiana These are all right. I think you have it. Great job. Flynn exchanged a triumphant smile with Debbie. She hadn't accepted him in the two weeks that he'd been married to Katie, not as her dad anyway, but he wasn't aiming for that. He just didn't want her to hate him. He was pretty sure he'd been successful in, if not becoming friends with her, at least making it so that she didn't glare at him every time she saw him. Part of that was because he'd been able to help her with her math. Katie had claimed that she didn't understand the newfangled way they were doing math and had asked Flynn if he would help when Debbie was having trouble. Flynn hadn't outright accused Katie of completely fabricating the fact that she didn't understand, but he suspected that was what had happened, which just made him appreciate Katie that much more. Did Dad ever call? Debbie asked as she put her books away. They had been supposed to go with their dad the weekend after Flynn and Katie got married, but he hadn't called, hadn't shown up, and didn't answer Katie's texts. Flynn and she had canceled their trip to go to Katie's parents because they spent all day Saturday waiting for Russell to show up. He never had. At some point in the past week, he texted and said that he'd get back to her, but he hadn't said whether he was going to take the kids over the weekend to make up for the weekend that he'd missed. Katie had simply texted him and said that Flynn and she were taking the children to visit her parents. Russell hadn't responded. Flynn supposed he was happy that it hadn't occurred to Debbie until just now, Monday night, to ask about her dad. They had all seemed morose but not particularly upset when their dad hadn't shown a week ago, but the visit with their grandparents over the past weekend had helped lift their spirits a bit. Flynn had a feeling they were used to Russell not showing, and Russell's lack of communication had pretty much confirmed that. It made Flynn angry but it wasn't something that he was going to be able to fix. It probably was something that he just needed to step back and not get involved in, although he had mentioned to Katie in the evening after the kids went to bed that he'd like to grab hold of Russell and shake some sense into him. He couldn't understand a man who had a family as wonderful as Katie and her children and just tossing it away, like they didn't mean anything. Debbie had her books put away, 
and they were talking about playing a game in the hour they had before it was time to get ready for bed, when there was a knock at the door. Raymond and Gwen raced to open it. They got there about the same time, then engaged in a short squabble over who got to actually put their hand on the doorknob, with Gwen winning. At their age, the two years that she was older made a big difference. Katie hadn't gotten any words out of her mouth to correct them when they opened the door to see Ellen and Tige standing at the doorstep. Evening, folks, Tige said, nodding at Katie and then turning his face to Flynn as Flynn stood up from his chair and walked over. Good evening. It's a nice one out. The weather was warm for early May, and when they'd been talking to the children about what game they wanted to play this evening, Flynn had suggested they go outside and take a walk. Knowing North Dakota, tomorrow it would snow, but they'd enjoy the warm weather today. Tige said, Sorry to bother you, but I was coming into town to do some grocery shopping when Ellen asked if she could come see the calves. Well, I figured I'd stop in and check. If you folks are busy, it's not a big deal. Please? Debbie turned to look first at Flynn, then turned pleading eyes to her mom. That's fine with me. She lifted her brows at Flynn, who nodded. We were just talking about going outside for a bit. It's a nice evening out. It sure is. That's what made me think about it. Oh, I should have texted earlier, but it's been so cold lately. They had a deep cold snap for a while, and today was the first day that had been above freezing in a week. It wasn't entirely heard of for North Dakota, but still, the warm weather was always welcome, especially this time of year. The kids were already putting their shoes on while Debbie and Ellen were huddled together giggling and whispering. We've named them April and May, and we're going to have them in the parade on Memorial Day. Mr. Flynn has been teaching us how to teach them to lead, and I get to lead one, and Debbie gets to lead one. Gwen spoke to the room in general, although her eyes were on Ellen and Mr. Tige. Mr. Tige nodded, a little smile on his lips. I think Ellen is in cahoots with all of you, because she's been working on teaching one of our other ones to lead, and I'm pretty sure she's hoping she can go down the street with all of you. They talked a little more about it, with Flynn shaking his head internally and thinking that he never thought he'd be part of a family who would get so excited about cows and parades, but the kids were really looking forward to it. They'd been brushing the calves every day, even trying to braid pretty ribbons into their longish hair. He didn't tell anyone, but in his opinion, the cows looked absolutely ridiculous with pink ribbons, because it was almost like putting jewels on a sow's nose, but it made the kids happy, so he was all for it. Tige promised to be back in an hour, and the kids ran outside. You're kind of being baptized by fire into this whole fatherhood thing. Katie said with a smile as she closed the laptop where she was doing some research. She had been talking to Flynn about possibly starting a small business where they raised Highlanders and sold them. It would offset some of the cost of feed, and they were both pretty sure the kids would be completely for it. It made Katie happy, far more than being a waitress at the diner, and that made Flynn happy. Debbie seems to be doing pretty good with you. Katie said, her brows raised, a smile tilting her lips up. Flynn loved that Katie was not trying to keep the kids from liking him or feeling competitive or acting afraid that they might decide they like him more. She encouraged them every chance she got to see the good in him. He had never been around someone who was constantly, if not singing his praises, seeing the good in him and just commenting on it. Sometimes it was stuff he didn't even think about, like coming home from work, washing up, and jumping into supper prep alongside of her. She didn't praise him exactly, but she'd just say something like, I love that you worked all day and you're still walking in the door and helping me with supper. I appreciate it. The kids had started thanking him too, after listening to their mom thank him two or three times. He tried to do the same for her, look for ways to show appreciation, ways to casually inform the kids that she was a great mom 
without coming right out and saying she was a great mom. And that was a statement someone could disagree with, but if he said, supper is amazing, you're the best cook I've ever met, that meant a lot more to the kids than him telling them, tell your mother thank you for supper. He wasn't sure where he'd figured that out, maybe just thinking about it for himself. If someone told him to say thank you, he said it as a rote saying without really thinking about it. But he always listened to what his parents said, and their opinions became his. Regardless, Katie had created that atmosphere of always lifting up the people around her, particularly him. In fact, while she was kind to everyone, there was no doubt as to who got the best of Katie. He supposed she effortlessly lived the Bible command of reverencing her husband. She seemed to do it naturally without putting any type of effort into it. It made him want to do everything he could to be a blessing to her in return. Would you like to take a walk? She came over and he put his arms around her. She laid her head on his chest. Today was the day they were supposed to progress from kissing on the cheek and forehead to hugging as well. They'd been hugging since the first day they were married, though, so Flynn was kind of thinking he might skip the hugging step and go right to the next one. That thought got him thinking about her lips, and so it surprised him a little when she pulled back. Then he realized her phone was buzzing. It's Russell, she said, her brows puckering before she swiped on her phone, pushing the button for speaker, and said, Hello. He knew it wasn't just his imagination that heard the more formal tone in her voice. She put up a little shield around herself any time she had to deal with him. Flynn figured she didn't even realize she did it, but Russell had hurt her, and while he didn't think that Katie was bitter, or even really upset about it anymore, he did know that he would never be a part of her inner circle again. In fact, Flynn suspected that if she didn't have to deal with him about the kids, she wouldn't answer the phone when he called. Katie girl, how are you, sweetie? Katie's lips pursed, and she wrinkled up her nose. Flynn didn't laugh, but he wanted to. She obviously hated the fact that Russell called her sweetie. Flynn figured that if he thought about it, he'd remind her that it was perfectly okay for her to ask him to not call her sweetie if she didn't want him to. Although, the little bit that he'd been around Russell, he suspected that Katie probably had asked, and Russell had probably ignored her. He didn't seem to be overly concerned with what anyone around him wanted, only about himself. Honestly, Flynn wasn't sure how Katie had put up with him as long as she had. It just went to show what an amazing woman Katie was. He only hoped that she didn't have to use any of that ability of putting up with him. He wasn't sure how long it took until the honeymoon stage ended, but he hoped he never got to the point where he didn't care and took advantage of her the way Russell had. I'm just fine. I was getting ready to walk out the door. Did you need something? Katie's voice was politely formal. Katie, you've been texting and calling and asking me to talk to you, and I finally called, and now you're going to tell me you're too busy for me? Russell sounded aghast, like Katie should drop everything the second he called, and perhaps he conveniently forgot that he did not do the same for her, ignoring her texts and phone calls for most of the last two weeks. You can tell me what you want, or you can call me back sometime when I'm not busy. Well, that's fine. It worked out well then. Robin and I are back from our little vacation trip to Niagara Falls, and I thought you could go ahead and bring the kids over for a bit and I can visit with them. Katie's lips had pressed shut, and a shadow of pain had crossed her features when he mentioned Niagara Falls. Katie had told Flynn one of the evenings they'd talked that Russell had always been too busy to go anywhere with her. So even their vacation had just been going to the cities and staying at a three-star hotel for two nights. They hadn't gone anywhere other than the cities, although Katie had appreciated the time away. 
She admitted to being disappointed, but not fussing about it because she wanted to be content. But she confided to Flynn that there were so many places in the United States that she had wanted to see. When he asked her about traveling abroad, she said she'd love to do it, but that she'd rather see all the amazing things in her home country first. She rattled off the ocean and the Grand Canyon and the Redwoods in California. And then she confided that Niagara Falls was the place she always wanted to go, and it was the one place she'd asked Russell to take her to several times. Flynn had all that flow through his mind, and it made him wonder if Russell was rubbing it in that he hadn't taken Katie, but he had taken Robin. I'm sorry, Russell. Tonight will not suit. There's only an hour, less, before it's time for the kids to get their baths and get ready for bed. If they go over to your house, they're going to be wound up when they get back, and they're not going to want to go to sleep. It's a school night. Are you denying me my visitation? Because if I have to, I will go back to a judge and I will demand that I get to see my children. You missed your visitation. We waited all day Saturday last week for you to show up, and you didn't. Flynn didn't understand how Katie still sounded so kind when he wanted to reach through the phone and grab a hold of Russell's throat. How could he be so arrogant that he should be able to see his kids whenever he wanted to and Katie should just do whatever he wanted? He wasn't thinking of what was best for his kids or their welfare. In fact, he hadn't asked about them, even though he hadn't seen them in two weeks. Flynn closed his mouth, biting down on his tongue. He was not going to get in the middle of this, although he did want Katie to know he was on her side. Katie had walked to the kitchen window, holding the phone in her hand. Flynn walked over to the window and put a hand on her shoulder. She looked up at him, a grateful smile on her face, as though she appreciated his show of solidarity with her. I missed my visitation because I was on a romantic getaway. It happens all the time. Now I'm home. I want to see my kids. It's not rocket science, Katie. It's just common sense. Now, are you going to bring them over, or am I going to have to call my lawyer in the morning? Katie was quiet for a moment, and while Flynn knew that she didn't want to fight with Russell, and she was most likely going to give in, he wished she wouldn't. If you want to see them, you can come pick them up, but I want them home by eight. They need baths because they were outside earlier and they need to be in bed by nine. Oh, sure, you're going to make me come get them. That's your little petty punishment because you're not getting your way. His voice held sarcasm and it didn't sound the slightest bit nice. Fine. I'll be there in ten minutes. Have them ready to go. I don't want to have to sit in the driveway any longer than what I must, even though I'm sure you would just love it if I had to wait around for them. Katie's jaw ground together. Flynn could hear her teeth screeching. But her voice sounded level and kind as she said, I'll try not to keep you waiting. She looked down at her phone, but Russell had already hung up. She pushed the red button anyway, then turned the phone off and let her hand drop. She took one sideways step and seemed to melt into his chest as she rested her head on him and put her arms around him. Why do I feel like I just ran a marathon? You are much nicer to him than I wanted to be. Am I being a pushover? I suppose there would be some circles that would accuse you of that. I think you are kind and I think you probably acted the way Jesus wanted you to, which is the most important thing. That's what I was trying to think, that Russell is a jerk. He's unkind and arrogant, and he hurt me pretty badly. He hurt my kids even worse, and I don't like him, but God loves him. God wants me to be kind to him. God wants me to be nice even when it hurts my jaw to keep from saying the things that I really want to say, even things I think maybe he needs to hear. 
he needs to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. If we say those things to him now, it's just going to fall on deaf ears. I know. It makes me sad. When I really think about it, it truly does make me sad. He has three amazing kids, and all he can think about is himself. She sighed. I'm not angry at his outrageous accusations and hurtful admissions. You are amazing. I love your compassion and how you're kind, even though he doesn't deserve it. I love that you are thinking about treating him the way Jesus wants you to, instead of the way I want you to, which is not nearly so nice. She squeezed him, and he had an idea he hoped would make her happy. Next week is the parade, and then the week after that, the kids get out of school. How do you feel about the next week, you and I going somewhere, though not to Niagara Falls, because I think maybe the idea of Russell being there is too fresh? Yeah, I want to go, but I don't want to go two seconds after he did. It's too much like I'm trying to copy him, when in reality, what I really want is to get away from him. So how about we go in the opposite direction? Let's go to the ocean. And maybe if we're really feeling crazy, we could stop and see the Grand Canyon or the Redwoods. What do you think? You and me. She leaned back and looked up at him. I'm thinking, yeah, I want to go on a trip with the kids. But you and I didn't really do anything when we got married, and I think that would be nice. He realized that was 100% true. Since Katie and he had reconnected, it was like their friendship had never let up from high school. And more than that, she quickly became his favorite person in the entire world. If he was doing something, having Katie beside him made it 100 times more fun. He definitely wouldn't mind going on a trip with her. And while he loved her kids and thought they were awesome, he thought Katie deserved a wedding trip, if they didn't call it a honeymoon, since, after all, they... Flynn stopped thinking right there. If he recalled correctly, if they skipped this week with the hugging and went straight to lips, the week they went on their trip would be the week that Miss Charlene had on the paper they were supposed to go into the bedroom and do what they knew they were supposed to do, or however she had phrased that. Flynn hadn't thought about the trip and Miss Charlene's kissing schedule in the same moment, but now that the idea was there, maybe it would end up being a honeymoon. He found himself a lot more partial to the idea now than he had been previously. He wasn't quite sure when the change had come about or where the thoughts came from, but as his hand moved down her back to the indent of her waist, then over the flare of her hip, and he breathed in the scent of strawberries, his heart started to beat faster, and his breath stumbled like he couldn't quite catch it. He angled his head just a little and put his lips on her temple. Are you okay? I'm fine. Why? You're just quiet. I guess I was thinking about Miss Charlene's kissing schedule. Her voice sounded almost sheepish. <laughs> That's funny. So was I. When I first looked at it, I had no idea it was going to play such a big role in my thought life, but it has. Same. What do you think? I was thinking. They started together and then laughed. <laughs> you go first, Katie said, not letting go of him or leaning back to look. She kept her face pressed tight to his chest, although her hand had started to move up and down his back, which he had to admit he really liked. I was just going to say that we've already been hugging, so I thought maybe we should skip the next step and go straight to the fourth. She huffed out a breath. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to suggest. He grinned a little, thinking that maybe he'd been nervous for nothing, since that was the direction her thoughts were going as well. I think, normally, I'm a pretty patient man. I don't usually have trouble waiting for things. But I'm feeling like the kids are outside, and while I suppose the anticipation of waiting until they've left with Russell might be a good one, 
I think I prefer to not. If you want to kiss me now, just say so. This time she did lean back, looking up into his face. I want to kiss you now. Okay. They were both smiling a little as his head lowered, and their teeth ended up clacking together before they adjusted their heads. After a little awkward fumbling, and they smoothed out in a rather wonderful way, if Flynn had to say so himself. Actually, it was more than wonderful. Katie sighed, and the gentle touch of her fingers on his neck, and the way the world shifted, and how it felt like they were the only ones in the universe, and how his fingers tingled as he suddenly seemed to need to grip her in order to anchor himself and not start drifting away all made him think that maybe they should plan their trip for next week, instead of waiting, too. I wasn't expecting that, Katie breathed as he lifted his head some time later. I suspected. I've been suspecting for a while, because my feelings have definitely shifted. I guess mine might have, too. I suppose I knew they were, but you're such a good friend. I want you to stay my friend. And I want to stay your friend. There is no rule that says lovers can't be friends. In fact, I think friends make the best lovers. Maybe it was his use of the word lover, or maybe it was what he was implying, or maybe it was just Katie's fair complexion, but her cheeks reddened. Thanks. Thanks for being a friend first. I appreciate that. Her voice sounded slightly less friendly, and he lowered his head again. I should thank you, too, for all the little things that you do for me to make coming home to you such a joy. She lifted her head, and he didn't give her a chance to answer, but lowered his lips to hers. He didn't know what Katie was thinking, but he figured he'd like to thank Russell for demanding that he get the kids more. This whole kissing on the lips thing was going to take some practice to get used to, and they'd have a whole hour without the kids to really figure it out. Flynn wasn't entirely sure he would be thanking Russell exactly when he came, but he'd be thinking thoughts of appreciation in his head anyway. Chapter 18 Laughter and a little snark never hurts. Connie Falcons, Kansas It had been overcast all day, but as the time approached for the parade to start, the sun peeked out and shone brightly over the freshly washed North Dakota landscape. Katie smiled at her girls as they led April and May off the cattle trailer Tig had brought to haul them and onto the street. They'd worked hard to teach the calves to lead well enough to be able to walk them in the parade, and, despite the loud noises and busy activity of people coming and going, the calves were doing great. Katie's eyes met Flynn's over her kids' heads, and they smiled. Maybe a bit of a secret romance passed between them, but their joy was bittersweet. Just before they'd left for the parade, Debbie had thrown a fit about her father. I know he said he'd come. You have to let me call him to make sure. She stamped her foot and crossed her arms over her chest. I've already texted him and told him about the parade. Katie tried to keep her expression serene. She'd texted him several times, asking, not quite begging, but coming close. He'd ignored her. She didn't have the heart to tell Debbie he'd not cared enough to even respond. She didn't want to hurt Debbie even more than she already was hurting. No, you didn't. You didn't text him. You don't want him to come see us. Debbie's red face crinkled and her eyes swam with tears. The diner had closed at three, just in time for Katie to get home and start helping her girls get ready. Her feet and back ached from being on them since before seven, but she wasn't going to miss helping the girls for this special occasion that they'd been looking forward to for weeks. Flynn had left work early, come home and joined in the washing and brushing, and even the braiding with ribbons, 
and Katie was eternally grateful that he'd stepped up and filled the role of father without her even having to ask him to. If she hadn't fallen in love with her husband already, just having him there for her as he was today would have made him irresistible. They'd made the kids come in to grab a quick bite to eat. Debbie was saying something about what a terrible mom she was, and Katie was listening, but she also smiled to herself as she thought about the kissing she'd been doing with her husband. Lots of kissing. Kissing didn't equal love. Not in her book. Not at her age and in her experience. But Flynn was a very, very good kisser and Katie had to admit that she looked forward to the time after the kids had gone to bed more than she'd looked forward to anything in a very long time. Of course, it wouldn't have mattered to her what kind of kisser he was if he hadn't been the man of character and integrity that he was. And the fact that he'd taken her children and treated them as his own meant more to her than any kind of kissing ever could. But a man of character, a man who loved her kids, who was more of a father to them than their own dad, and who was also a great kisser? She looked across the table at him as he brought in hot dog rolls and set them down. Choosing Flynn was the best decision she'd ever made. Tell him. She pulled her lips in. She should. Tell him. Tell him that he was amazing and she couldn't help falling in love with him. Did, in fact, love him. But this was the weekend that Charlene had written down for them to, how did she put it, go into the bedroom and know what to do, or something of that nature. She bit down harder on her lips. The idea made her nervous. Or maybe that was excitement coupled with the fear that he'd not be as happy with her as she was with him. Maybe that's why she wanted to postpone it. Do you need me to do something? Flynn asked softly, coming around the table and putting his arm around her. Katie realized that Debbie was still crying and accusing her of standing between her father and her, and that was probably what Flynn was talking about, not what she'd been thinking. Thankfully. Um, do you think it would be okay if I just let her use my phone to call him? She hadn't allowed the kids to do that much because he usually didn't answer, which either made them sad or made them blame her for keeping him from answering, since it was her number that showed up. It was crazy how it was always her fault. Something Russell had encouraged, and perhaps even taught, that she wasn't sure how to undo. She loved that Flynn did not answer right away. He pressed his lips together, thinking, and she appreciated that more than she could say. That he wouldn't jump on the suggestion just with the hope of making Russell look bad, but was actually considering how it would affect their kids. You aren't even listening to me! Debbie cried, stomping her foot, tears streaming out of her eyes. I want my dad, my real dad, to be there, and you don't even care! Flynn held her eyes and nodded. I think you should let her call him. Katie stared at him for just a few more seconds. It might hurt Debbie more tonight, but perhaps in the long run she'd realize who she could really count on. Or maybe Russell would surprise them all and actually come. Okay, Katie pulled out her phone. Here, Debbie, go ahead and call your dad. Debbie's eyes widened and her look was triumphant as she glanced at Flynn, although Katie didn't know why. After all, Flynn was the one who had just told her to allow her to call. It didn't take long for Debbie to pull Russell's number up and hold the phone to her ear while it rang. And rang. His voicemail answered. Debbie pulled the phone away from her ear, pushing some buttons and trying again. She got his voicemail again. He won't answer because he thinks it's you and that you're going to be mean to him. Debbie's face scrunched up in a wrinkled mess. I've never heard your mother be unkind to your dad, not even one time. He pulled his phone out of his pocket. If it's okay with her, you can call him on my phone. 
He won't recognize that number, and maybe he'll answer. He lifted his brows in question, and Katie nodded, a little uncertain. If Russell did answer, it would just prove Debbie right, that he didn't want to talk to Katie. Still, Debbie wanted to do everything she could to make sure her father was there to see her in the parade, and Katie couldn't say no. Katie read off Russell's number as Debbie punched it in. She held Flynn's phone to her ear as it rang. Russell answered on the second ring. Hello? Daddy, you're coming to the parade tonight, right? Debbie's eyes sparkled with triumph as she glanced at Katie. Her whole posture exclaimed that Katie was the reason Russell hadn't answered. Who is this? Russell said. Dad, it's Debbie. Debbie's lips pursed. This is a weird number for you to be calling me from. It's Mr. Flynn's phone. You weren't answering Mom's phone because she's so mean to you. I know she's mean. And yes, I try to avoid talking to her so she can't accuse me of causing all the problems in her life. All she does is complain and blame. So, about the parade, Dad, where are you going to be? Because I want to wave to you when we walk by with April and May. Who are April and May? Russell sounded confused. Those are our new cows, Dad. I told you about them the last time we were at your house, but you couldn't get out and see them when you brought us home because you were afraid Mom was going to start griping and complaining at you, and you don't like it when she does that. Oh, cows, right. So, are you, Daddy? Am I what? Coming to the parade. I know you are. Just tell me where you're going to be. Oh, where I'm going to be at the parade? Yes, Daddy. Well, I wasn't going to come to the parade because I don't want your mother to yell at Robin, and Robin wouldn't want to stay home without me. Mom will stay home. She looked up at Katie. Right, Mom? Katie's heart felt hollow. She'd put all the work in, helping the kids learn to lead the cows, talking to people at the parade committee to make sure the girls could go, set things up with Tig to get the cows to the beginning of the parade route, and spent the time and money to get them ready. Flynn had helped with every step, and Russell hadn't had a thing to do with it. Now he got to be the one at the parade while she was supposed to stay home. Pain cut deep through her chest. Anger, hot and fierce, had words on the tip of her tongue before she'd given it much thought at all. She'd opened her mouth to tell Debbie and Russell exactly what she thought of them, but a warm hand landed on her arm. She looked up into Flynn's face. He gave it a slight shake, and with that shake, reason returned to her head. Getting angry and sounding off on everyone wasn't going to fix any relationships. She lifted her chin and took a deep breath. I can stay home if he wants to come and watch you all. Those words tasted sour in her mouth. She didn't want to miss it, didn't want to not see her kids in their first parade, didn't want to not get to see their happy faces, shining eyes, and proud steps as they led the animals they'd spent so much time cleaning and training. It wasn't fair. But life wasn't fair. She wasn't called to be the fair judge anyway. She was called to be kind, to be a servant, to put others above herself. She swallowed hard and closed her mouth. Daddy, Mom will stay home. You can come. There was silence on the other end of the line for three seconds. Then Russell said, I would love to come, but I thought your mother was going to be there, so Robin and I made plans to take a little weekend getaway to the cities. I'm in St. Paul and couldn't make it back in time if I wanted to. I'll be sure to plan for your next parade as long as your mother promises not to be there. There might not be a next parade. I want you at this one, Debbie cried. 
I wish I could, sweetie, but I can't. So next one it is, I promise. You promised to be at this one last week when I told you about it. I told you Robin gets hurt when your mother is mean. I couldn't do that to her. Miss Robin doesn't have to come. You do. You're my dad. And sometimes dads need time to themselves. You had a weekend to yourself. But that's not like this. I need time to relax and recharge and to build a strong relationship with Robin. What about me? You need time with me. And we'll get time together. Plenty of time. Trust me. Russell sounded irritated. Put your mother on the phone. I thought you didn't want to talk to her. I thought you wanted to talk to me and see me in the parade. You said you would. Debbie, I want to speak to your mother. Put her on the phone. You have to come, Daddy. You have to see me. Debbie's words were barely coherent between her sobs. Katie's heart lodged painfully in her throat as she listened to her daughter and felt her heart break. It was so hard to not hate Russell at that moment. Not necessarily because he wasn't giving Debbie what she wanted. Kids had to learn that sometimes life didn't happen at their convenience. But because he was her father and Debbie had every right to expect him to not only keep his word, but to expect him to want to go see her no matter what she was doing. Give your mother the phone. Russell's voice was not quite a yell, but it was strong enough to penetrate Debbie's tears, and she handed the phone to Katie before running away. Russell? Katie's voice shook. She hated that, but couldn't help it. Why did you do that, Katie? What would cause you to allow Debbie to call me on a number I didn't recognize? Did that little scene make you feel good? I can't believe what a witch you are. Katie tried to breathe before she answered. Whenever something bad happened, it was always her fault. Flynn lifted his brow and held out his hand. Katie's eyes widened. Normally, Flynn stood behind her, supporting whatever she did with her ex and the kids, but he didn't usually get involved. Maybe it was the tick of a muscle in his jaw or the throbbing of a vein in his forehead, but it was easy for her to tell that he was upset, angry even. But those were the only signs. She didn't think he was going to flip out. She glanced at Gwen and Raymond, who had been playing in the living room during the entire phone call. They might be listening, but Katie suspected they were like normal kids and most of the adult drama went right over their heads. She barely thought about it before her hand moved, holding the phone out for Flynn. Russell, it's Flynn, Katie's husband. Flynn didn't pause for Russell to acknowledge his words. I can't make you be honest with your kids, and I can't make you not lie about Katie, but I'm not going to allow your lies to go unrebutted any longer. When you blame your incompetence as a parent on Katie, I'm going to make sure the kids know the truth. I don't want to see the kids be pawns in your issues, but I won't allow them to continue to believe lies. They deserve to know the truth. They're not your kids. You have no rights to them. If you didn't want another man spending time with your kids and making sure they know how to tell truth from lies, you shouldn't have cheated on your wife. I want to talk to Katie. Then you should respond to her texts or answer her calls. Right now, we have a parade to go to. Maybe she'll feel like talking to you tomorrow. Flynn didn't wait for Russell's answer, but slid his phone off and allowed his hand to drop to his side. Chapter 19 Choice. You must choose each day to love your spouse and choose to make your marriage work. Gloria Mishler, Pearson, Indiana I hope you're not too angry with me. Flynn's word held concern, but no remorse. 
Katie realized her hand was at her throat. Her entire body trembled, but not from anger. Maybe from reaction. The feeling that someone was finally on her side, as much as she hated that there even were sides. Maybe it was just hard to be forceful with Russell because he'd caused her to doubt herself so much. And now, finally, someone believed in her. Of course, she knew her friends did. Her parents did, too. But Flynn's belief somehow gave her confidence and filled her heart with a warmth she hadn't felt for a very long time, if ever. His defense felt like weight lifted from her shoulders like he had picked the burdens off her back and started carrying them for her. Like she had a partner and a friend with a common goal of building a family and teaching them to follow Jesus. I'm not angry. You're something. Amazed, humbled, trying to figure out what to say and unable to find the words for how much I appreciate what you just did. I made a decision about the kids without talking to you about it. You said we'd make sure the kids knew the truth. I won't ever argue with that. It's wrong the way he made you out to be the bad guy in everything. I was hoping as they grew, they'd see the truth. I think they will. Kids are smart that way. But it's causing you needless pain right now. And they're not too young or delicate to know that their father made choices that are hurting everyone in this family, including me. You? She knew he loved her kids, but to hurt when they were hurting was a love she hadn't realized. Because when you hurt, I hurt. When your kids hurt, we both hurt. And while I don't think that we need to avoid all pain, this pain is unnecessary. He paused. I admire how you've been with Russell, how you've been kind and compassionate and returned good for his evil. But I don't think we need to support his lies, and I don't think the kids are too young to be told that what he is saying isn't true. I agree. I suppose it was just too much for me to do by myself. And she hadn't wanted to bring her entire family or all of her friends into the mess that was her life right now. They would want to help, and they would, but it would be more emotions than she would need to handle, and she hadn't felt strong enough. She glanced at her watch. They had a bit of time before the parade. Do you mind going with me to find Debbie? I don't think there's ever going to be a good time to talk to her, but we have a few minutes now. Sure. They glanced in at the living room where Gwen and Raymond still played before going up the stairs to Debbie's room. As Katie opened the door slowly, she saw Debbie lying face down on the bed. Debbie, she said gently as she sat down beside her daughter, fully expecting her to yank away. He said he'd come. Debbie's muffled cry made Katie's already hurting heart crack more. I know. Katie stroked Debbie's back. I'm sorry. I hate him. Katie sighed softly. What to say? Flynn's hand came down on her shoulder. A sign of support, a help and comfort, a reminder that she was not doing this alone. Maybe that's all she needed because she suddenly had words. Daddy isn't perfect. He never will be. There are always going to be things that he does that we don't like or that hurt us or disappoint us. Just like there are always going to be things that I do that you don't like or that hurt you or disappoint you. And you are going to always do things that hurt people and disappoint them but we know what we need to do. No, what? Debbie turned her face a little. We all do things. We all sin and hurt and disappoint God. And God loves us anyway. He forgives us. He wants us to try to do better and to keep loving the people around us. 
like he keeps loving us, even when they hurt us, even when they do things that aren't kind or nice. I don't want to be nice. I want to hate him forever. I know. I feel that way sometimes, too. About Daddy? Sure, about other people as well. But I know that's wrong. That's not the way God feels about me when I sin. How can I expect God to forgive me when I won't forgive others? Katie knew she was talking to herself as much as she was talking to Debbie. After all, she felt like she hated Russell at times. Robin, too. But that feeling of hate wasn't right. For the same reason she'd just given Debbie, God forgives, and he wanted her to forgive, too. I don't want to. I want him to come home and live with us again. I'm sorry, honey. That's not going to happen. Katie didn't see any reason in giving Debbie false hope. From the time Katie found out that Russell had cheated, she had worked on forgiving, but the marriage covenant had been broken, and he had shown no remorse. Without remorse, repentance, and a lot of work, it couldn't be repaired. She could forgive. She was working on it. But from that moment, there was never a chance that Russell would continue to be her husband. It wasn't about forgiveness. It was about breaking a covenant. But today wasn't the day to explain all that to Debbie. I guess this is about forgiveness, but it's also about making decisions that hurt people. We like to think our lives are all about ourselves, but every decision we make affects the people around us. Daddy made some decisions that he felt were good for him, but that hurt us, his family. We have to forgive Daddy for that and I'm trying, and I hope you are too. But we can also learn from that. We don't want to be selfish and make the decisions to do what we want, whether that's leaving our family, or saying unkind and hurtful things, or stomping around and making the people around us miserable, and not care how they affect other people. Maybe that was a concept that was a little too hard for a ten-year-old and Debbie's face showed that she really didn't understand, but it was something that it wouldn't hurt for her to hear and to think about. Jesus said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Flynn spoke for the first time. Katie reached up and covered his hand with her own, silently thanking him for taking the conversation in a direction that Debbie might be able to understand. Before we do something to someone, we can think to ourselves, how would we like that done to us? If we wouldn't want someone to do it to us, then we shouldn't do it to others. Debbie didn't say anything, but her eyes dropped down and she looked at the baseboard on the far wall. Katie allowed some time to pass. Then, hoping she wasn't pushing too hard, she said, I think that's enough lessons for one day. We have a couple of cows who are waiting to go to a parade, and I'm hungry. Want to go eat? Debbie nodded. Then she pushed herself to a sitting position. Will you be at the parade, Mommy? I sure will. Will you take pictures so you can send them to Daddy? Katie flinched inside, but she held her expression steady. Yes. I want a hot dog. Debbie jumped off the bed and ran out of the room. Katie would have liked to have hugged her and made sure their relationship was restored, but she supposed she couldn't force that on anyone. She stood, and Flynn's hand moved from her shoulder down her arm, weaving his fingers through hers. You did a great job. Thanks. I wish so hard I could fix it for her. She moved toward Flynn and he put his arm around her leaning her head on his chest, grateful for his solid strength that gave her something to lean on. She closed her eyes and squeezed her arms around him. I know, it's hard, but she'll grow and become a better, more compassionate person because of this, as long as you keep guiding her in that direction. We, 
as long as we do it. You've made the burdens in my life so much lighter. One of those burdens is wondering how I'm going to raise my children to love God and want to serve Him. There are so many things that look more appealing. And they're easier, too. That. Just keep being an example they can look up to and admire. There isn't much else you could do that will have better benefits than that. It's so hard. Life isn't supposed to be easy. Maybe not. But having you around has made it more fun. I don't think anyone has ever said anything like that to me before. Flynn sounded a little shocked. I look forward to the kids going to bed, because that is the most fun part of my day. You don't say. There was a smile in his voice that warmed her the whole way to her toes. I do say, and I mean it. It's the best part of my day, too. She paused, then plunged ahead. I suppose with a little adjustment, we could make that time last all night. He froze, then his hands started moving over her back again. I thought maybe you'd be too worried about Debbie to think about making a move like that. Not that I'm complaining. I love my kids and I want to do my best for them. But they'll grow up and move on. What I have with you is for the rest of our lives. And she knew that to be true. Flynn was as steady as a man could be. She could put everything she had into building something with him and know that it would not be wasted time on her part. I'm so glad you chose me. His voice lowered and he whispered, Katie. She closed her eyes and shivered the sound of her name on his lips, the most beautiful melody she'd ever heard. Say that again. I'm so glad you chose me. My name, in that tone, the one that makes all the good feelings curl down my back. Katie. I love you. Oh, Katie, I love you too. Maybe she was smiling a little as she lifted her head. Maybe he was, too. She wasn't sure since her eyes were closed, and she held tight to him as his lips came down on hers, and they kissed for a long time before she remembered about parades and cows and hot dogs. Family things. Things that floated around, but were not nearly as important as the people who lived and breathed and learned under the same roof together. Epilogue Being committed to the relationship and to keeping it strong, putting God first and treating your mate as your best friend, being open and honest with each other, and do or say something every day to let them know you love them. Understanding that marriage is like a roller coaster. Sometimes you are up and euphoric with the love and happiness you have, then sometimes you are wondering who you married and why. Know that the up will be coming again and ride out the rough times. Being partners means helping each other through the ups and downs of life. Mary B. Peck, Kansas The last strains of Bach's cello suite number one drifted off into the night. Katie held her clarinet loosely in her hand as her head leaned against the back of the swing, Raymond's head lying in her lap, Debbie and Gwen sleepy on the porch floor, and Flynn slowly lowering his viola from under his chin. That was magical, Katie said softly. Flynn smiled, his heart warm and full. What is magical is having all of you here with me. Debbie hadn't gotten better overnight, but it had been four months since the parade, and she seemed to understand that Russell wasn't ever going to do what he said he was. Or maybe she just realized that throwing fits about his lies didn't help anything. Flynn wasn't sure. She wasn't calling Flynn dad like Gwen and Raymond were, but she'd stopped hating him, or at least stopped acting like she hated him. 
He wished everything was perfect, wrapped up in a happily ever after like a sappy romance novel. But life just didn't work that way. A warm summer night breeze blew over the porch as he turned his head to look at Katie. Maybe their family wasn't perfect, and maybe Katie and he didn't always see eye to eye about everything, but their relationship might just give a sappy romance novel a run for its money. I think it's time to put the kids to bed, she murmured, and he smiled. That was their little way of saying they looked forward to the peace and quiet and couple time that happened after the little ones had been taken care of. He didn't jump up, but her words sent a thrill of excitement through him. Maybe after they'd been married years or decades, he'd get tired of spending time with her, but he didn't think so. Tig and he had been talking about that very thing earlier in the day when he'd brought Ellen over to see how her calves had grown. Tig had said that after being alone so long, he didn't think he'd ever take having someone to talk to, to hold and share his life with, for granted. Flynn had to agree, even as he felt bad for his friend, so far from the country he'd grown up in and no closer to finding someone to be with than he had been months or even years ago. The kids stirred, and Katie carefully moved Raymond's head as she stood up from the swing and started putting her clarinet away. Maybe he'd talk to Katie about saying something to the peacemakers. Maybe they'd have an idea of how they could find someone for Tig. He was a good man, a hard-working, honest man good with his niece and with the boys who seemed to hang out at his house, a man like that would make an excellent husband and father. Surely the peacemakers would be able to help. As much as he loved his friend, Flynn forgot about him until much later that night, long after the kids were in bed, and he was too, wrapped around his wife, smiling and idly thinking how Russell's cheating on Katie was the best thing that had ever happened to Flynn. He wanted to say that to Katie, to point out that God could make something beautiful out of pain and despair, but her even breathing told him she was already asleep. So he just stroked her hair and whispered her name before falling asleep with a contented smile on his lips. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.